Hello, everyone. This is Artemis with the Uncivilized Podcast. The episode you're about to listen to features Klee Ben Ali. Klee Ben Ali was a Dene indigenous anarchist, agitator, artist, uh, did a lot of different work. Uh, their most current project that many people are going to be familiar with is Indigenous Action in the Indigenous Action Podcast. Of course, the book uh, that we were talking about, kind of guiding the episode you're going to listen to, No Spiritual Surrender, uh, came out earlier in 2023. This episode was recorded on the 10th of December of 2023, and I'm recording this kind of preface or intro on the 31st. Uh, it just became public that Klee passed away recently. So I just wanted to say, you know, this episode obviously didn't go up for Klee's passing, which is unfortunate. Um, I dedicate the episode to Klee. You know, I didn't know Klee directly uh, very long. I wouldn't say that we are any by any stretch of the imagination friends. I'm not going to claim any of that shit. Uh, but it's still unfortunate because I like Klee's writing a lot. Uh, the conversations we had in the podcast, while there is tension, you know, and some disagreements, I appreciate uh their arguments and their perspectives a lot. Um, we had conversations outside of this uh, this medium that I appreciated as well. Uh, it's really hard knowing that this person that you're going to listen to isn't with us anymore. Um, but it's it's harder knowing that there's people that Flea was very intimate with, very close with, made an impact on both people they organized alongside, but organized in the defense of or in solidarity with. Um, and now, you know, so Klee's memory in that sense lives on the impact that they've made in just the friendships and intimacies that that person had. Uh, so, you know, maybe just keep that in mind, thinking about the work that they talk about in this episode and how that moves forward, knowing that Klee is gone and thinking about that impact. Um, you know, again, this episode's dedicated to Klee. Uh, all the resources we talk about are in the description. Uh, so thank you for listening. I hope you enjoy the episode. Hello, everyone. This is Artemis with the Uncivilized Podcast. Today, we have Klee Benali, Dene author and agitator. Recently, they just authored the book, No Spiritual Surrender, Indigenous Anarchy and Defense of the Sacred. They're also the designer of the upcoming Burn the Fort tabletop game. They're also a co-founder of Indigenous Action. Klee, how you doing? Yeah, uh, I'm doing all right. I uh, appreciate the day and the opportunity to participate in your podcast and see what kind of shit we can stir so i'm looking forward to it oh that's that's my favorite yeah so i mean first of all before we get into any of the questions is this book is fucking awesome by the way it took me a little bit longer than it should have to read just because i'm in a busy time but when i would pick it up it'd be hard to put down and i've been, I've been sharing excerpts with friends indigenous and non-indigenous and everyone is just so so into it i have a friend who's been on the podcast before malatha and he just he's not a reader that's not where his interests are at um but he's asked for the book he's like finally a good book i'm willing to read because every time i send him excerpts he's just blown away and he, he loves everything that's that's in there so i mean this book is great i really appreciate that feedback it's sometimes hard to track or tell what the response is going to be i mean intentionally i was looking to put forth this provocation and agitation of filth and fire to elicit condemnation and, and you know agitate as and provoke as much as I can. So it's good that you connected to something in the pages. Yeah, yeah. So I guess question one, and this is something we've been asking a lot of people is, you know, who's the guest? So who is Klee? Like, let's let's hear the journey. How did you get from wherever you started to this moment now? Yat e she Klee dashijinne. Um, my name is Klee, originally from what is called Black Mesa on Dinepakea, or the Navajo Nation. Currently, I reside here in occupied Kinflana, or so-called Flagstaff, at the base of Dakota Sleet, what has been named the San Francisco Peaks. And uh, I think the book documents my journey to some degree because it became, in many ways, a little bit more of an introduction and a little bit more of an uncomfortable autobiography because I hate such storycraft, as I mentioned. 
but it, you know, it's always important to introduce ourselves as the ne people, establish where we come from, who we are in relation to existence and each other through eh, or what we call our sort of clan system. Uh, so yeah, my journey is a strange one. I'll just provide a little short perspective. You know, I was raised in the heart of the so-called navajo land dispute, essentially a conquer-and-divide tactic established by the U.S. federal government and their tribal neo-colonial puppet entities to access coal resources underneath the land where my families are from. One of the largest coal deposits in North America is located under this area. And so for more than 60 years, essentially what, you know, the Navajo Nation had become was a resource colony. And this area was part of the geopolitical push to develop the rest of the region through power, mainly burning coal, building coal-fired generating stations, the transport, so many other aspects. But to access that coal, relocation was part of that plan. And in 1974, the year before I was born, shows you how long I've been around, uh, the U.S. Congress passed PL 93-531, which is the so-called Relocation Act. And it's explicitly designed to force the removal of Diné people from our homelands and some Hopi people from their areas because they were misled to believe that there was a range war and there would be bloodshed if they didn't intervene between the two peoples. Though we lived side by side, there have been many inter intermarriages, ceremonies, exchanges. You know, this was a fabrication by these colonial forces to access the resources. And since 1974, there's been a powerful resistance of my matriarchal elders, my family, and also, you know, it has led to the, the brutal relocation of, uh, at this point, probably about 20,000 people. And I consider myself a refugee in many ways of that program. And a lot of the people I grew up with are as well. Some of the families are still holding out. They're very strong. And that's where I gained my teachings from, aside from my father, who is a Hathathli, or a medicine practitioner. So I was raised in ceremony since the beginning, since I can remember with my brother and sister. And we grew up into, <laughs> and somehow uh, became well acquainted with punk rock and started a band back when we were like 10, 11, specifically to address this issue, really, because we had so much rage and punk rock was the only thing we could relate to. That band was called Black Fire and we toured for like about, I don't know, 30 years almost. And at some point, you know, that guitars don't stop bulldozers and you can only do so much from a stage and the performative aspects, you know, of indigenous expression in political music can only go so far. And so that project ended. But, you know, I carry forward these sort of fires, many fires of the teachings of my ancestral ways um, through ceremony. So that's a little bit of it. And you get uh, probably a bit more of a prosy, poetic picture by reading the first two chapters of my book. Yeah. Out of curiosity, with the band, because in the latter half of the book, you bring up punk. Um, and I find it interesting, did, did the project end partially, because you're kind of talking about the performative nature and there's not a lot you can do from the stage, were you ever scared that your band might have gone the way of a lot of punk that you kind of talked about becoming like commodified and leading to this kind of hypocritical culture where you ever stared your band was going that way or was it or is it very intentionally avoidant of that i was never scared of it we were conscious of it i mean we followed the footsteps of fugazi we followed the footsteps mm -hmm. of like hardcore diy like you know punk crews the subhumans were a big influence of course the ramones in a different way 
um, mm-hmm. and a, a range of other, you know, just powerful bands that had the intentional DIY life that said, fuck the corporates, fuck the majors, let's carve our own paths autonomously through yeah. expression, you know, and agitation. And to me, that's really what spoke to me and still does to this day. But there's a distinction and I don't want to talk too much about it because it's really not the purpose of this show, in my opinion, between the politics of my brother and sister and, and what my anti-politics are. That also was part of the wedge. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. So as I mentioned earlier, you are one of the many co-founders of Indigenous Action. I was wondering, could you talk a bit about what the purpose of that is and it's kind of different sub projects such as the podcast? Uh, indigenous action is anti-colonial propaganda and action or attack um, back in, and it actually has roots in Big Mountain in Tithinsta, mm-hmm. uh back in 2001. And this is during the fever of like indie media. So there was, uh, you know, access to uh, what people were calling the quote unquote democratization of media, which is such a weird twisted term but Mm -hmm. accessibility in terms of like being able to produce our own narratives and take that out of the control of the monopolization of corporations who were really in the you know that's why we started the band was because you know people were listening to everything that was happening and our relatives who were resisting were being extraordinarily vilified and um you know, Indigenous Action was part of that. There was a Sundance Grounds that was offered as a ceremony site um, and hosted by my my auntie, Louise Benali, at camp, and it was called Camp Enemy Sundance Grounds. And the Hopi tribe said it was an illegal ceremony. They came in with bulldozers in August 2001, and they desecrated the whole grounds, and they arrested one of my <laughs> one of my cousins, sorry, I don't know why it's making me emotional, because uh, he, he passed on. Um, but uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a devastating moment, but it was interesting because I had encouragement from people who were part of the wave of indie media. And mm-hmm. uh, they were like, hey, let's get a camera, let's, let's do some editing, let's do all this. And so I just went up, I just interviewed my elders, my relatives, I documented as much as what was happening and and mobilized so people could see just basically to shine a light on the devastation desecration the wanton like really i mean this was just a a brazen attack they put if anybody knows anything who's listening about the tree of life in the sundance grounds they put that tree through a shredder and so whoa people were just utterly devastated and this is you know a neo-colonial force going to and the outside, people are like, oh, the Hopi tribe's just regulating their territory uh, under their authority. And the other side, it's, you know, indigenous folks who are, you know, maintaining ceremony as part of their way of life and resistance, not just as a political act, of course, but, you know, powerful acts of inter-indigenous ceremony. And it was, yeah, just totally destroyed. So that's really where indigenous action started. And it just built from there because... There wasn't a lot of eyes and there was a lot of um a lot of work that was being generated from the anti-globalization movement at the time because that was you know post the battle of seattle quote unquote Mm -hmm. and uh yeah indie media was strong so that's sort of where indigenous action comes from and it still continues to this day and just to be clear it's like a a loose-knit collective people come and go um some folks have just like you know autonomous projects where we write, contribute whenever we feel like it. There's no pressure. We don't have a fucking, it's all community supported. Uh, we'd pay whatever we can just to maintain things and then put together as much slick fucking anti-prop, anti-colonial propaganda and try to stimulate, promote, support as much attack as possible. And we organize infrastructure too. Okay. What's its relationship to the, to the info shop? Uh, Tullahoe and Info Shop was established in 2007 uh, here in occupied Kinthlana as a, what initially was a media center, actually, because we initiated um, at, with Indigenous Action uh, a media contingent 
training group of indigenous youth who were addressing media, what then became media justice issues, because in the the sort of height of the struggle to protect the holy San Francisco peaks here, which I'm sure we'll get into discussing. So, you know, folks will understand that we're battling to protect this sacred mountain that's holy to 13 indigenous nations from ski area development. And I'm sure we'll talk more about it, but there was a youth movement called Youth of the Peaks and they were rabid and autonomous and they were able to mobilize 200 people, you know, mainly youth at their gatherings, their demonstrations, decked out in camo and like, you know, very militant language. And they were attacked viciously, of course, uh, because of that by local authorities. And uh, same thing vilified in the media. And they were like, well, let's make our own media. So we just set up trainings, taught them how to, you know, document their shit and just use their voice in different creative ways. It wasn't just all a quote unquote political project. So out of your backpack media needed a space because we kept going around in town asking people to set up all this equipment, tear it all down. Cause back then it was pretty big, but we could fit a lot of it in backpacks. Um, mm-hmm. and that's an accessibility statement and assertion. And, uh, yeah, we we were like, let's fucking start an info shop. There's been a couple info shops in this area before, but they're all been white anarchist spaces. And so we paired the media center with an info shop and said, well, one might work better than the other one. Let's experiment. So we didn't, you know, we, I'd been part of establishing autonomous spaces before or projects to get them off the ground. Mm-hmm. And one of them just failed because we tried to plan everything, fundraise, get all this shit together before we even had a space. In this case, all the youth were ready. We were just like, we just need a space. So we got the space. We locked in some funding uh, from our own pockets. Everybody pulled whatever they could together and just sat there for a month and met and figured out what we wanted to do. Then we opened and we established a vision for the space. And it still continues to this day in different ways. Um, you know, it's 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 changed and shifted over the years, which is good because, uh, you know, we, we weren't set out to build an institution of a space. We wanted it to shift based upon the needs and, you know, the use really of this infrastructure. And at one point, uh, actually Aragorn came through and he was doing a tour um, in addressing conflict infrastructure. And we were like, yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Let's, let's, let's address this, place and asserted as conflict infrastructure and we composted the old collective because of some issues and it's been pretty much a resource on that level since to stimulate conflict anti-colonial conflict particularly in this area and we technically own the building which is very complicated and i don't want to get into it because fucking hell that's really (laughs) a shit show and trying Mm -hmm. to reconcile all those contradictions but we had to otherwise the city of course would have attacked us wherever we were and we had issues with leases before because of what we were doing so we were able to do some fucking wild uh or receive some wild blessings and got that space and we're still there yeah and you say it's in the book you on page 227 you say it's been around for 16 years which as you say is ages a much r- radical projects which it's crazy to think about because i had to sit there and think about it. i was like damn they're right like that because how quickly and it's not a necessarily a bad things that that projects like that don't live very long but it is something to be said about the sustainability of it right its ability to to reemerge and deal with the contradictions that inevitably come out of that both internally and externally and those are things that you talk about um, yeah, in we, the book we weather many storms and we have many lessons and experiences of failures and that's why we embrace cycles in the space and try not to institutionalize it because we're we're learning from that space but more than anything and this is coming from our own people in the way we said it is it's really an autonomous indigenous space that's holding on, you know, before land back really, um, right. you know, as, as a bit of what, you know, my, my father's calls a stronghold. And a lot of mm-hmm. unsheltered relatives that we work with, there's always, there's always something going on, always something that we can apply ourselves. So it's interesting, but yeah, I highly encourage people to examine like the ideas of institutionalizing and sort of sustaining, 
spaces and propping up projects that sometimes just need to be composted so other things can grow from them. Cycles are beautiful, even if they sort of end in destructive, you know, maybe failures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of an underlying theme of the book, particularly really comes up, and I'd say the last half is this idea of settler time and like non-settler time and the idea of cycles. And like, that seems to be, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, that seems to be an underlying philosophy, at least for you and the way you approach agitation is seeing it through the lens of cycles and not necessarily point A to point B. Absolutely. And I found that really interesting. I also love, and I'll reference the, the page one more time, is that you say the dirty dishes get done and the trash gets taken out eventually. I just, something about that, I, I love that. Yeah, well, if you know, you know. <laughs> yeah, right. So I guess, you know, when people hear the title Indigenous Anarchy, people are going to be like, oh, so anarcho-indigeneity, right? And that's a th something you talk about, you know, a lot in this book is, no, it's not, it's not a synthesis. There's no hyphen, right? So, you know, obviously you're Indigenous and you're an anarchist. What is the relationship there? Is there something to be called Indigenous Anarchism? And related to that, you talk a lot about like the redwashing of ideologies like liberalism or Marxism. How does anarchism relate or not relate to that same critique? You know, it's it's an interesting question, and I will answer this different ways depending on who I'm talking to. Um, you know, I'm curious as to like why, and I write explicitly. I you know ask these questions: why other, you know, like settler colonizer anarchists are interested in answering that question or the response because i think the assertion is out there like i wrote um a noble um mm -hmm. very specifically to address this a bit and um it was a huge question and uh that zine unknowable was published in the book there's probably like you know a quarter of the book was already published in zine formats but um I, I repeat this quote over and over through the book from my late uh, grandmother, Roberta Blackout, who was a resistor from the Big Mountain area. And she says, this land is sacred land. The man's law is not our law. And the nature and the food is the way we live our law. This is really, it embodies the teachings of my father you know, every literally every time I talk to him, and he's in his nineties right now. He's he says the same thing, and he says their their laws are just temporary. It's not our way. We live with nature. We belong to the earth. We don't control yeah. it. And there's a whole cosmology to understand with that that embodies this idea that can only correlate with autonomy. But it has an interesting resonance with anarchism. But to me, it's a contention because I think it's really a misstep. And that's why I say unknowable to force uh, indigenous existence into a political category and box so people can define it, which inevitably becomes object objectified. And in terms, especially of the academics that are running around with you know, anarcho-indigeneity or whatever, and anarcho-indigenism merchandise it. Um, and so, you know, to me, it, it the idea of indigenous anarchism, unhyphenated, um, it should be a contested space always. And, you know, there's a lot of, you know, white anarchists or colonizer anarchists who just are salivating over, like, the understandings of that and the connection right. to it and, and it's it's an interesting colonial logic um that i try to address and confront in that piece um and it's also the terrain where academics right now specifically uh you know including indigenous ones really are jumping into the fray to define what it means um and I th again, I think a lot of that's just merchandising. Um, mm -hmm. There are a lot of folks who've been addressing this issue. I mean, I mentioned, referenced Aragorn earlier with locating indigenous anarchism and his piece, uh, non-European anarchism. He put a lot of thought into addressing this question and, you know, comes up with some of the same points of 
you know, in, in non-European anarchism, he says the formation of a non-European anarchism is untenable. The term bespeaks a general movement when the goal is an infinite series of desperate movements. A non-European anarchism's thumbnail sketch of what it could be an African anarchism, a Maquiladora anarchism, a Plains Indian anarch indigenous anarchism, an inner city breed anarchism at all. Mm -hmm. A category should, should exist for every self-determined group of people to inform their interpretation of a non-European anarchism. And I think that's it speaks to this issue of the interest in sort of, you know, creating, flattening out these ideologies and imposing them upon people who are extraordinarily beautifully diverse in their expression and experience and context. Um, you mm -hmm. know, to, to, Nye, to, to Winneke, who's brilliant, um, indigenous anarchist uh, eloquently states, you know, my ancestors wanted autonomy. I want that too. And I don't know how much there is to elaborate from that. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's really something that was documented and we, we called, there's a handful of us that called in 2019 for indigenous anarchist convergence. And we hosted it in occupied Kintlana at Tala One info shop. There's about 130 people who showed up. We were sort oh, wow. of overwhelmed. And it was a really, it was interesting because a lot of colonizers wanted to attend and they wanted to document. They wanted, <laughs> you know, a piece of it. And we were just like, no, we haven't even had this conversation ourselves. Why right. are we going to be in the space where we're servicing a gaze that is one that is very conflictual and has. You'd be like, it'd be, it'd be kind of like a voyeurist exhibitionist almost kind of thing in a way. Yeah, I mean, it depends on who's showing up and what their intentions are, but I don't want to presume. But we, we needed this space to have this discussion because it hadn't happened before on those terms. Mm -hmm. And so um, one of the report backs was written by an anonymous Deneb person, and it was titled Firewalk With Me. This was published in, um, I think, Black Seed. It was published in the, the newspaper and the book. It was published online and Digitus Action. And I think their quote is, is is worth quoting at length um but it says the indigenous anarchism i saw was kind of unfamiliar and mostly unappealing i believe people will grow this indigenous anarchism and ideology succinct enough for instagram stories 280 character limit tweets and vibrant screen printed art excuse me memes a movement global enough to essentialize a radical humanist and materialist struggle of indigeneity so others will comfortably speak for any absent voice, uh, a resistance so monolithic, the powers that could be could easily identify that rep repress all indigenous anarchists. And, and, I, and, I, and this I quote in the book, um, they go on and say that, you know, the potential, and this is the most important point for me, the potential I've discovered that the convergence is the particulars of Dine anarchy. I suggest that Dine anarchy offers the addition of a choice to attack and assault on our enemy that weakens their grip on not only our glittering world, but the worlds of others, an opportunity for the anarchy of Inde, Autumn, and so on to exact revenge on their colonizers until that's all that's left for Dina anarchists is to dissuade the endorsements of the next idol expecting our obedience. And yeah, there's not much elaboration again for me. And we, we actually had a, a pre-gathering um, to the gathering at the Talawan Info Shop, we hosted up at one of my uncle's place on Big Mountain, uh, Leonard Benali's old place, and um, there's a lot of elders who came, and uh, there was a few few people, only maybe two or three people from the convergence that made their way because it was early in the in the in the week, not on the weekend, and it was a long time to commit to be out there. But yeah, we. You know, they slept in a hogan traditional home and spoke with elders who don't speak english and through translation you know wow. there was a lot of teachings that to me were just the expression of not study of not theorizing of but the practice of being in existence in autonomy and asserting that against these forces that have tried to move them for so long and they're still there. Mm -hmm. And so to me, that was probably the mo actually most powerful part of the convergence and a lot of people missed it. Um, mm. and I, and I write in the book, if I may go on, cause to me, again, this is a big question. 
Oh, yeah. Um, I, I kind of figured because there's so many facets to it. I mean, you spend so much time even talking about it in the book that I kind of anticipated yeah. a long answer. Yeah, it, it's, you know, I, I write that before colonial invasion on these lands, indigenous societies existed without the state, not in spite of the state. We existed without the state. Our project is, in, and I assert that our project is to replace the principle of political authority with the principle of autonomous indigenous mutuality to live a life in conf conflict with authoritarian constraint on stolen land occupied land is a ne negation of settler colonial domination and i further add at different points like that, that we view anarchism as a sort of dynamic bridge a set of radical is in total negation to be clear about you know my terms radical ideas that are connecting points between anti-colonial struggle and indigenous liberation, a practice that expresses and asserts autonomy with respect to the context of where it is located, place. And that's, you know, what Aragorn was very focused on. And then I, I go on, if anarchy is a quote unquote revolutionary idea that uh, no one is more qualified than you are to decide what your life will be, then we offer that indigenous anarchists consider how deeply the you or we are is part of our mutuality with all existence. So, mm -hmm. you know, when anarchists say no law above myself, uh, we say no law but nature. Mm -hmm. And so if I may move to the, the question about redwashing and it sort of gets, actually it's connected to the uh, convergence um, mm -hmm. and, and my own identification personally as an indigenous anarchist, which I, I actually write a little bit more about in the introduction to Black Seed Not on Any Map that was published by Little Black Cart Press, mm -hmm. which I highly recommend because there's a lot of different voices that you know address that same question. Uh, and actually, yeah, before you before you move on, is this episode won't even be out for people before Little Black Cart unfortunately shuts down on mm -hmm. December 18th, which is eight days from the day we're recording. Yeah, um, that's that's in in that family will be missed in that way. But as I said, cycles and things grow mm -hmm. and move on from the compost. And there's some beautiful compost that was, you know, made from mm -hmm. that project. But um, yeah, I, I, I've been very reluctant to call myself an anarchist for a lot of reasons. And I state this in a lot of my writing. And mainly it's because of the the, the challenging matter of coloniality and assumption and expression of white anarchists. I mean, a lot of people don't remember APOC, um, anarchist people of color. I was around for that and I was constantly invited and I, I, I interfaced with people who were part of it and I was on the periphery, but I never felt like, yeah, I'm going to just dive in mainly because I, I, I was contending with my own sense of direction from my cultural understandings in addressing politics without the language that I needed to contend with some of the liberal tendencies that I had at the time and uh, address this, like what, what people will call political growth. I mean, mm -hmm. I, would, I would probably characterize more as political deterioration, thankfully. Um, and so, uh, yeah, you know, I was invited to some, uh, book fairs to speak with other groups of people because you know we're part of an info shop and we were having discussions and addressing indigenous anarchism uh for years and so it, it was always a space where we felt like we needed to challenge whiteness first and not have the conversations and develop our discussions and ideas more about what it meant aside from the scraps of reading you know writings that you know, we're from like Rob Los Ricos, for example, or Aragorn, or really a very small handful of people at the time. But um, eventually for me, you know, in, indigenous anarchism is just a, a placeholder, like a, a bridge, as I mentioned, a dynamic bridge. And I don't really have any use for the term. If something in, more interesting comes along, I'll use that. But it, it's good in the effect that it cuts through bullshit. You know, mm -hmm. people, people know that I'm not going to be, you know, having a conversation about how quote unquote voting is sacred <laughs> or, <laughs> um, you know, talking about a Biden versus Obama and 
all that bullshit, you know, and yeah. cutting through the bullshit of reformist, you know, ideologies. And I think there's other sub contentions, if you will, regarding individualism and collectivism and all that shit that are obviously tensions within the anarchist scenes um, as well. Yeah. But, uh, you know, those are just, you know, things that I think are interesting too and spaces to explore from an indigenous perspective. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, uh, but I want to get into the question about redwashing of Marxism because, uh, and you, you ask, a, you know, in at least in the text that you sent me, how I, how anarchism does or not fall into a similar, similar critique. Um, it does. I mean, in, in unknowable, I, I really try to contend as much as I can with the, um, the, how adjacent anarchism has been to settler colonialism with no right. critique and no action through its celebrated history. I mean, a lot of people, you know, comfortably read and celebrate Voltaire de Clare's essay on direct action. And I mean, it's so bad in how it celebrates Bacon's rebellion, which is just, you know, a colonial and, and, and she's, she's unabashedly pro-colonial in the treatment mm -hmm. of that aspect of the story as an example of um, direct action. And I'm just like, how yeah. did people miss that all these years? Um, and, I, and I pick on that. There's more that, you know, she wrote about and many other an anarchist forces. Wrote I mean, a big part of that, I mean, thought. a big part of that is that that's, oh, this, <laughs> excuse me, that's this early American anarchism are very, you know, what uh, Benjamin Tucker says, unabashed, uh jeffersonians or unterrified jeffersonian like it's rooted in this i this libertarian you know what my, my friend calls homestead or or house on the prairie kind of thing like they're so obsessed with that that it's it's a re reassertment of this kind of freedom on terra nola kind of thing you know yeah and i i to be clear i am against and i think um it needs to be abolished this idea of american progressive anarchism mm -hmm. and you can easily identify what it is right <laughs> and where it is and how it exists um and i the same way about you know I'm, I, I write more than just against the quote-unquote red washing of marxism i write against marxism specifically in revolutionary mm -hmm. socialism for the same similar reasons i think there's you know i lean towards anarchism because it can translate into what I understand as my ancestral teachings and relate to the land. The concepts are the same teachings as I, as I mentioned through the book. But when I look at revolutionary socialism or materialist dialectics and Marxism and, you know, all the offshoots of MLM, you know, bullshit and, you know, beyond just like the historic authoritarian brutalities, you just look at the industrial you know, the vision of utopic industrialization mm -hmm. of the world and the domination of a, you know, the dictatorship of a proletariat. And you can see that the earth is, the sacredness of the earth is not. And, uh, you know, I've had so many debates and contentions with folks, and there are a lot of indigenous Marxism, Marxists out there, including, you know, those of the Red Nation, which we don't fuck with. Um, mm -hmm. that were part of the reason that we were just like, yeah, let's, let's call this convergence together. This is mm -hmm. time because we see all oh, these, okay. you know, academics, you know, white academic Marxists giving books to young indigenous minds and in their classes on Marxism. And, you know, a lot of them aren't really critical because they don't either. I don't, I mean, I don't want to make assumptions, but what I will say is they probably should listen more to their ancestors than Marx. Yeah. Then, I mean, also, in addition to the, you're kind of talking about the tensions with anarchism, and you reference it a couple of times, and I, I, obviously it's understandable why, is we don't need, talking about Kropotkin in particular, we don't need more dead white Europeans to tell us how to live, right? And so I find that interesting that there's this idea of identifying, at least in some sense, with the idea of anarchism, but not necessarily with its genealogy, I think is one way you put it, the genealogy of, of anarchism. And I find that really interesting. Anarchism was the response to a problem in Europe and 
you know, those response that, that those problems were brought over here too. So we mm -hmm. have a bit of perspective, but the root space where that needs to be contended, it's not really our space. And I'm not really interested in those conversations. I think it, it's, it's good to study, you know, I, I mean, this why, you know, I, I love to read and I love to not shy away from things that I don't agree with. And so, um, you know, I'll, I'll read stuff. I think it's important to read it critically from those yeah. perspectives, especially with cultural context. So, you know, li, you know, sure, read Marx, but not more than listening to, to your ancestors or read it with an informed position and think right. more deeper and critically about what the implications are in terms of those teachings. And the same goes for anarchism, same goes for all the whatever political expressions. Because at the end of the day, you know, I, I've arrived at this space of anti-politics because of those conclusions, they all lead to the same dead end and they come from the same dead source. Mm -hmm. So uh, kind of on the red washing thing, one more point before we move on is it reminded me, it was having, it was one of those things that, you know, I mentioned him earlier, Malatha was having an argument with this Marxist that we went to school with. And he was one of those, if he didn't get the microphone, he didn't want to be part of it. You know what I mean? Those type of people, oh, I don't want to be there if I can't speak. And I remember they got into an argument and Malatha is one of those people. And I, I respect it a lot. It's I won't argue with white people anymore. And so he, he showed me what was happening. He said, you want to, you want to do it? I was like, fuck it. Okay. And he was like, well, you know, in this, this Marxist was like, well, indigenous people love Marxism. Like, I'm telling you, there's a lot of indigenous Marxists. I was like, I'm not, I don't disagree with you that there are, but I think what you're doing is you're just selecting voices that serve what you want. And I remember he shared me something from Red Nation, or maybe it wasn't, but it was, a, and it was some indigenous Marxist that was basically saying like, well, Marxism was prefigured on indi in indigenous cultures like the Haudenosaunee who did this and they were they were kind of like a dictatorship of the proletariat before the proletariat i was reading and i was like what the fuck <laughs> what, what am i reading it was yeah uh yeah it's I bad mean, that, it's so bad I, I, i'd be more interested in talking to your friend about this and hearing their narrative directly because it's again you know you're you're relaying something based upon experience and context and right you know, for you to judge that from your position i think is is interesting because there's a lot I, you know, I mean, if people are done talking to white people, that's fine, whatever, um, you know, because sometimes there's just no point, especially when it comes to that, especially with PSL or fucking, oh my God, people and yeah. you know, all that shit who just, um, really co-opt and, you know, find ways to assert their agenda above. Right. Um, but yeah, you know, I get into it in the book, um, there's a lot of, I think, people who latch on to the idea uh, that uh, revolutionary socialism or Marxism has been a base of anti-colonial struggle in different areas. But I contend, how indigenous is that? Mm -hmm. Because when I look at those struggles, they're national struggles. They're, they're trying to assert state structures. They're... You know, look, you look at the characterization and the industrialization. You can look at, you know, South America with the expressions and like, you can either look at Chavez or you can look at the fucking indigenous people in the forest where mines have been nationalized and they're still ravaging at a more accelerated rate, the devastation of their sacred lands, the poisoning of their waters and the death, direct murders of indigenous people. And we, we say, what's different? You know, who's, mm -hmm. the, counter, who's the next counter-revolutionary? Right. Know, the authoritarian component is an aspect of domination that should not ever be overlooked. And that's why, you know, I talked about the historical aspects of the expressions of, um, you know, what have been the experiments of revolutionary socialism or you know, dialectical materialism is expressed through Marx or Lenin or Stalin or fucking Mao. But I mean, fuck if I'm going to, you know, be quiet when some in indigenous Marxist celebrates Stalin's birthday by posting a picture or post pictures of Marx and turquoise and fucking headbands and shit like that. Oh my God. Yeah. Oh no, my God. 
But yeah, yeah I mean, I mean, and just to address what you brought up, I mean, Goodwin, I think it was Goodwin, and there's a few other people where you know folks have you know done the study enough to say, oh yeah, we can look at points where um, Marxism or you know even Hegel, then go back to Goodwin, all these people who were settler invaders in the U.S. brought wrote and brought back these concepts that they felt were quote unquote utopian. Um, and that informed a lot of the thought and thinking, but in a fucking hyper industrial society that was mm -hmm. really stratified via class in extreme levels that had, you know, been coming out of inquisitions and fucking series and series of wars and domination and violence and fucking, you know, and the names of gods and kings and you know, these, these manifestations of these states. So they were looking at, you know, using these teachings to fix a problem. So why the fuck go through the detour of Marx? Why don't go to right. the Lord Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Um, I didn't have this question, but you reminded me. Have you read or are you familiar with uh, the two David Wingroves, um, uh, The Dawn of Everything? And like the claims they make about like the indigenous enlightenment or the indigenous critique in its relationship to the enlightenment. Uh, I've read a, a bit and I've, yeah, I've had some discussions, but yeah, it's not really, my pastime isn't really interested in studying those problems again. You know, I'm mm. interested in the critiques and I think there are other forces that have pretty much sort of hit the hammer on the head with, um, or hit the nail on the head. I don't know. Hammer, hammer on somebody's head. Maybe a revolutionary socialist head. Um, <laughs> to 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 make it clear. But yeah, it's it's not really my pastime. Gotcha. I just find it interesting. Uh, you know, I tried reading it. And, you know, they make an interesting critique, and I I see that right. Like they they're coming from a very stratified society: England, Spain, France, right? All those countries. They come over here and they see people that are in a much higher level compared to them, free. All right, and then they have dialogue with these people and they take those ideas back, you know, and I'm all for that, recognizing the indigenous role. But in the same end, they have this idea that that to recognize there's freedom, right, and to try and replicate those that freedom of these other societies in your own industrial context. Like, to, if you deny that, you're a conservative and you're anti-indigenous. But what I don't understand is you're anti-indigenous to recognize that indigenous societies have historically been more free than stratified European societies. Like that just doesn't, that never yeah, made a whole I lot mean, of sense to me. You're digging into John Moore's utopia. You're digging into right. the counter to that is John Mohawk's uh, Utopian mm. Legacies, which is a mm. powerful, profound book. And there are other folks, you know, who have written on this issue addressing, you know, the, the, the enlightenment and, you know, this push that has propelled the ideas of quote unquote civilization uh, as, you know, created as a template and pattern primarily and um, machined in Europe. But yeah, it's, it's a, uh, I think it's important to understand part of that context, but uh, mainly because it's still operating today. And I highly recommend, highly recommend checking out Inamike's writings on this issue. Um, beautiful work that tears apart these ideas of enlightenment and coloniality um, exactly with the aspects of what you're saying. If you haven't had them as a guest on your show, they could definitely respond to that question a lot better than I could. Okay, well, noted. Very interesting. I appreciate it. So moving on to the next question, um, and I know this is contentious within and without Indigenous communities, but how would you define what does it mean to be indigenous, right? So I know some people, they appeal to blood quantum. Uh, it's cultural. It's a relationship to land and non-humans. So for you, how do you define indigenous, if it's definable at all? Well, I'm curious as to why you asked that question and what your definition is. Yeah, so I asked because... You know, I've had, you know, again, I've had people on, I don't want to keep saying, oh, I've had indigenous people on the podcast before, um, you know, but it's interesting because there, there's the issue of like blood quantum and they're like, so, and then especially white people always 
you know, when I have this show or, you know, if they, if in this case, everyone I've had on, I've known personally, people always want to say, what, what can I do? Or, you know, there's almost a, what is the word, not tokenization, but I'll, I'll use that a tokenization of indigenous culture. People want to be indigenous, some people, but then they're like, well, you know, I wasn't born that way. And also gets into like the issue of like this uh, state versus federally recognized. And like, if you're Lumbee and like, the issues that come with being Lumbee within Indigenous communities that's been explained to me, right? And that's not my area of expertise, and I don't speak on authority. It's just, it's always interesting um, that there's, that for something that seems like a simple answer, there's a lot of debate about it. And so when we talk about Indigenous anarchy, you know, you can, anyone can just identify as an anarchist, right? There's principles, but you can identify with it. But to identify as Indigenous, right, on what, what the accessibility of that looks like. You know, and some people say, well, if I live off the land, I'm indigenous. But, you know, you even say living off the land as a settler just re-perpetuates settler myth. And I find so that's just an interesting question to me. And again, referring to Malatha, he has these three, three ideas of what it means to be indigenous. You can be indigenous culturally, indigenous politically, or indigenous, for lack of a better word, by blood or by lineage. And so that's kind of like his base is you can be all three of those. You can be one of those or obviously none of them. Right. And so I was just curious. But for me, yeah. like, I feel like indigenous would have to be, yeah, like you have to be born somewhere. Everyone's indigenous to somewhere, theoretically, right? Or realist, really, they are. But it's also, it has to be a relationship to colonialism and then also through colonialism to the land and other people. Yeah. All that's too convoluted. And I really wanted to ask just to get a sense of, you know, the, the impetus behind your question to get an idea of what you're really asking. And, and it sounds like your question is still trapped in colonial logic. Mm -hmm. uh, to be indigenous means to be of the earth. It means mm -hmm. to be living with, not against the earth. It means to uh, understand that relationality that you have with all existence in terms of creation. And part of what comes with that is in the responsibility to where you are, because that establishes who, how, why, all of these things that flow, that give us meaning in our life. And that's what it means. Some people have just destroyed that so much, they can't recognize that relationship and connection anymore. But my father oh. says, we... We all, you know, some people say we don't breathe air. Or, no, some, some, he says some people say we're not close to nature anymore. But he mm -hmm. says, you breathe air, you drink water. Right. You, know, you walk on the ground. You know, what ways are you not connected to nature except for the ways mm -hmm. that you destroy it? That's really interesting. That also gets into the if people are interested in the issue is, but, you know, when people say we're separate from nature, it's like, okay, then what do we live in? Like, oh, we live in civilization. But then it's like, and I get when people say natural, they don't mean literally natural, right? They mean like an authentic life perhaps, but it's like civilization from a certain perspective, right? Is natural, but it doesn't mean it's sustainable or like doesn't have inherent contradictions or, or whatever. Right. And that's, to me, those are interesting questions. Like, are right, what is natural? What is nature? But I think even asking those questions, if you have to ask those questions, it, you have to be in a You're certain condition to be asking those questions. You've already alienated something. If you, right. And you need to come back and that's, you know, we could talk about pretendians. We could talk about blood quantum, but it's a, it's a colonial logic in a state induced, problem that's about management of who and what so you know they can control and exploit and it's you know that i'm not interested in having that conversation with you here on this you know i think it'd be a different conversation with other folks which is more important you know i don't okay. know your audience enough and maybe your Fair friend enough. that you reference would be interesting to talk to about it but yeah i mean and i just, just to be clear it's like you know when we say we're all indigenous because some people could interpret what i said by that and it is in many ways true but you know fuck a hippie that's trying to connect or fuck a you know green anarchist who's trying to rewild on stolen land mm -hmm. yeah i mean that was i remember when you got to that part in the book you're like the fetish you know the fetish and the abuse and things that happened within green anarchists and rewilding spaces i always find that interesting because it's like 
Yeah, yeah, I won't get into all that because there's I know there's people listening there and they're really fucking upset about that, and that's fine, that's you know, whatever. Talk oh, about man. it in the comments. Let's come out swinging. Uh, and we, I think we talk about it. Yeah, I think you have some questions that relate to that if you want to bring it up again. We'll see where the conversation goes. Yeah, so I guess before we, you know, we go with that, I kind of want to return to the book a little bit. Um, where does no spiritual surrender come from? And, you know, it's interesting because you talked about that at the beginning is you didn't mean for the book to be so autobiographical. And what's interesting is the the book doesn't follow your life. You're not making like, oh, and literally this happened and this happened, but you've been involved in these spaces. And if it wasn't you, it was friends or family that have been involved in those scenes that, you know, like you're not without context, right? So it still influences you. So you can refer to yourself or your immediate surroundings. Um, but why? I so not only where did you jump from, but maybe importantly, why did you write it, and who did you write it for? Well, to respond to your first comment, just real quick, is that I mean it's practical. I, I'm I, a lot of the shit I, I share is just because of experience, mostly bad. So I wanted to address that, and it's not mm -hmm. theory. You know, I, I never went to college or barely graduated. I, I, some people would contend that I didn't really graduate high school, but that's another story. And a, a lot of the autobiographical points, I make sure are truncated. I don't share everything and I don't intend to ever. Um, but, you know, unless we have some tea and we have that interesting connection. But yeah, I, I've, I've written a number of zines over the years and eventually in the trajectory of, I guess, radical quote unquote production. If you outlive your enemies, perhaps these collections of zine becomes books. I don't know. It seems like, you know, a lot of my friends went that route. Uh, unless you're an academic, of course, then it seems like a mandatory process by which you subject, you're subject to all sorts of wild standards, and, you know, processes. And I, I, of course, obviously it's not a project like that. Um, this is a project that it really couldn't have come to being um, and I, and I credit and I talk with about Aragorn a lot because he, yeah, he was, he pulled me out of this like interesting space of reluctance and, uh, of engaging in a lot of these conversations in, in a, in a really awesome way. Um, if he didn't offer the invitation to co-edit Black Seed, uh, and, and, and we had so many discussions, you know, building up to that, um, you know, I, I think uh, I really wouldn't have been able to write this book the way in in the time that I did. Um, I think at that point, uh, when I co-edited Black Seed with him, it, it, he he passed during, just to be clear, um, mm -hmm. our work on it together. Um, and I believe that I think one issue number seven had already been printed with the change of subtitle from a, a journal of like something like green anarchy to a journal of indigenous anarchy very intentionally. And I wasn't part of that, you know, it was just something that him and his crew had already considered. And you know, he, he published his turtle Island fight for turtle Island book, just traveling around, having interviews and myself included. And, uh, this collaborative co-editing effort changed uh, me and probably Aragorn a little bit to great frustration, um, trying to pull shit out of me and get me to work on certain deadlines, but really to just work on my writing skills. And um, after that came out and LBC started, or Little Black Heart started working on the anthologies of Black Seed, which I wrote an introduction um, and assisted with the editing on the Not On Any Map book. Um, I assessed, oh, okay. I assessed a lot of my essays uh, and, and some of the pieces that are published in this book are published in that book. Um, I assessed a lot of my essays, published um, many uh, and unpublished scraps of paper I'd written and realized I had probably over 50,000 words. Uh, and I initially wanted to just have a small reader, like a pocketbook, because I felt it was going to be more accessible for folks, um, not too hefty. <laughs> uh, and... Um, Somehow it ended up being over 108,000 words. And actually it was more. I probably cut down like over 100 some odd pages from this book. Oh, shit. Um, so yeah, it's, it's <laughs> I, I don't know. It felt like it, somehow it just came out. And you know, the why I wrote it is really due to utter frustration at the uncritical commitments of 
you know, people who have been on the front lines of indigenous struggles, land defenders and water protectors, hashtagging defend the sacred while begging politicians to recognize their pain. And, mm -hmm. I, I, it, you know, like people putting out voting is sacred shit and people, you know, celebrating Obama's like fucking scraps that fall off the table just for any ounce of recognition and considering that a win and that's the trajectory now with the, the domination of indigenous capitalists using the nonprofit infrastructure to drive a lot of these campaigns which are actually they're in the backseat of because a lot of the agendas are set by the quote-unquote big green um, corporate nonprofit industrial groups uh and it's fucking disgusting in my opinion that that's where we're at in terms of the tra trajectories of indigenous liberation and there's not a lot of, a lot of people who are really real-time critiquing it on in this way and I, I literally was um messaging the publisher detritus as <laughs> they were going through their edits uh with just examples of like some of the shit shows that were happening. I was like, we need to get this fucking book out now. Cause look at this bullshit that's happening. <laughs> you know, it's like, and this is constant. And so, you know, I feel like a lot of the analysis, the point is to agitate and provoke and fucking challenge. And I don't expect people to agree. I don't expect people to, uh, I was, I'm hoping for the debates. I'm looking forward to the contentions, looking right. forward to the condemnation because it draws out that tension. And I think that right. um, distinction is really important because ultimately this book is about two paths. Um, you know, what does it mean to go with our ancestral teachings in uh, a way that carries forward these fires of autonomy and for liberation or do we just keep fucking begging colonial politicians to hand out scraps so we can mm. say that we're quote unquote still here? Yeah. Or we're, I gotta we're say resilient. too. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to, to speak over you, but what I what I if I were to give you know like a word to describe this book as confrontational is probably a word that I kept kind of come back to when I would think about this book or when people ask me to describe it. It's, like, it's confrontational because you know it, it's like you said it's not theory, right? It's not getting into like. The philosophical questions or anything like that because it doesn't need to and i would you say confrontational and people you know when they hear that they, that's a very negative word but i think it's very positive because you're for your mate you're confronting difficult questions and difficult histories right like you said to pull that tension out you're inviting the debate and i appreciated that a lot when i was reading it the contention i have is all laid out in the last chapter with your use of positive and negative to describe it but yeah mm -hmm. i think that the the conflict you know is essentially going to be negative mm -hmm. we need to lean into that understand right. the experiences that we have mm -hmm. sometimes and figure out how that we can learn from it mm -hmm. so yeah it, it is uh it is confrontational and that's the point and i get a lot of things wrong i mean i i stated in the introduction i'm, I'm not trying to get on some fucking high horse and say that i've got everything figured out um, mm -hmm. and I think, you know, it's clear, especially in the last chapter that there's, um, a lot of challenges that I'm contending with as well. And, you know, I'm not trying to put myself in a position where I've come to the end of my growth in understanding how things mm -hmm. work and what is effective in this world, but I know it doesn't work. And that's mm -hmm. why I think it's important to just put it out there like this. Mm -hmm. For that last chapter too, because we've mentioned it a few times, is that one I you know I didn't, I just I I just didn't say I didn't expect it. It was it was a lot of it was a lot of great stuff, um, you know, confronting nihilism and then talking about like Baden and the Mardini Dane and all that was really great. Um, I want to skip ahead down the list of questions I had is because um, I was wondering if you want to bring them up and you do. do the you, individuals, do you what's up? Because you, you you asked an important question about who the oh, book yeah. is for the audience do you mind if i just oh yeah, yeah yeah go for it you know it, it's um i believe i make it clear uh in the book it's for young indigenous folks you know i spoke with the many indigenous folks who came up in the political sense at standing rock and they had so much fire and beautiful rage but 
uh, not a lot of them had a larger critical context to analyze and challenge the experiences in a way that I thought uh, could have helped move through a lot of the trauma that they or was holding on to them and they were holding on to. And so, um, of course, this dynamic exists beyond that fight. Uh, but over the years, I've experienced myself. And, and I say in the introduction, my younger self would have hated this book. I would have mm. detested this book for a lot of reasons. And it would have probably taken a long time for me to come around and be like, oh, okay, I see where things are at. But I think you know who it's not written for. But obviously, there are parts that hopefully are relatable in some ways and meaningful. Mm-hmm. to to others because you know for me words are medicine and if somebody can find something useful in the pages that helps them and their efforts towards liberation then i think that's you know part of it for me yeah i guess and that's interesting when you say who it's not written for and who it is written for because at times i read it and i'm like you might reference a cultural or historical but particularly like a cultural aspect of of the dinner uh, culture Dine. and I'm like oh Dine and so I'm interested I'm like oh like and I'm like, oh are they going to talk about that then you don't I mean sometimes you do but not always and then I'm like you know it's interesting that you're not writing an encyclopedia it's not a manifesto you're it's not an ethnography at times so you reference it but you're not you know you're not doing kind of like the anthropology thing you talk about right the stilling of the when you take tradition or history and you're framing it in a certain way that cert- the literacy, settler literacy, which we can get to, but I, I, I'll go for it. Sorry. I, was, I just, in some way, like, I appreciate that, that it's like, Oh, like, I don't need to know. Right. The point of the book is I don't need to know that. Right. And I can go and look it up, you know, maybe it's cool or we can talk about it, but it's not essential. Right. And so I, it's, yeah. You should be able to piece together. Oh, the, sure. The, the sort of, you know, whatever's, being said there based on information i mean i don't have a i don't have a hundred footnotes per fucking chapter right 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 there's right. no, glo- there's no glossary mm-hmm. i don't actually and it's going to piss people off but i don't have that's kind of what i'm getting at though yes yeah, there's no there's no uh like appendix or anything like that <laughs> very intentional yeah yeah so i just wanted to say in many ways i kind of you know i really appreciate that so but yeah i guess the the thing i wanted to you know, I guess who, it, you know, who it's written for, who it's not written for. And then you, in the last chapter, you reference a lot of things like queer nihilism and, and nihilism, generally speaking, and your relationship to that reminded me of your relationship to anarchism. And I think, you know, I, that makes sense. But then you reference ITS, for those that don't know, it's individuals tending towards savagery or tending towards the wild, depending on the translation. Um, and, you know, I've, had extensive arguments with people about them, people who support them and are indigenous or not indigenous, and they like to hide behind, well, they're indigenous and they're defending their ancestry and their, you know, and their land. So you can't critique them. I'm like, that's such a, like, that is a really weird argument to me, but I never really, I was like, whatever. And then you mentioned them and you mentioned them in a very critical way. I was wondering if you could elaborate on that. Um, Yeah, there's a lot to talk about. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Utah Phillips once said, "The earth is not dying." Famously, everybody knows this quote: "The earth is not dying; it's being killed, and the people who are killing it have names and addresses." Mm-hmm. I think ITS and all the odd, fucked up offshoots of it got that part right, but the indiscriminate aspect is the crux of the matter for me. Mm-hmm. You know, attacking anarchist squads, random folks, because you maybe missed your mark. <laughs> um, you know, I don't know any indigenous peoples that would welcome their own people back into their circles with that, without ceremony, without addressing, okay, where, what is, where, what are we doing here? Where are you going? Right. You know, I could, deep, I, could, I could dig a lot deeper into the net teachings, which I allude to in the book about those who attack their own people and the lessons we have, especially from our creation account. We have a huge experience in our creation of people who went outside of the circle and we welcome back. We have ceremonies mm-hmm. specifically for that, that I, I reference. And that's why, you know, in that last final chapter, I talk about, you know, what's a warrior, you know, too. Right. Uh, and, you know, I don't see that from my perspective as a Dinette person. 
in these folks who are, um, you know, expressing themselves in this way as quote unquote eco extremists. Um, and you know, a lot of the, a lot of the understandings, these conflicts are documented by anthropologists with guesswork and Tony Hillerman novels about indigenous relationships to you know, those who have harmed our own. Um, but for me in my teachings, the net aspirations of what we call which is a foundational way of being, which, as I mentioned in the book, and this is well documented, uh, is a guiding way of living in harmony with existence towards old age. And it's not indiscriminate. So, you know, the defense of it is not indiscriminate. It's intentional. Protection mm -hmm. of it is not indiscriminate. It's intentional. So my clear response is some people are so wounded and only focus on that. Just focusing on the tooth and the claw is never going to make you whole. Right. In my, in my opinion, it's not much different than those are, who are seeking domination. I don't see much difference because it's about power. And they're clearly not punching with, they're punching across or down even, you know. I, um, I embrace, in that last chapter, I embrace the idea of destroying what destroys us after serious contemplation through ancestral teachings and reconciling, you know, those teachings. And there's absolutely intention and focus to be located there. Yeah, that, that, that reminds me of John Moore, before he passed away, wrote, it was a small essay uh, called Beyond the Fragments, a reaction to industrial society and its future. And he said something along the lines when he was, you know, he was kind of dissecting Kaczynski's manifesto. And he said, basically, like to put it bluntly, at best, uh, FC has things ass backwards. Human regeneration can only emerge from cultural regeneration. The attempt to prompt human regeneration in the absence of cultural regeneration can all too easily result in totalitarianism. It basically says he puts too much emphasis on the spears and not the drums, right? And I find that I always that always like stood out to me, right? And that's a similar critique could probably be made of ITS or those kind of indiscriminate groups, generally speaking, especially within the anti civ milieu. Yeah, they have two degrees. So yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. That was just when I read that, it, I knew I had to ask just because, you know, th that discussion, I think, has died down a lot since then. But I appreciate that you confronted it just because, wow, it was I wasn't I was getting into anarchism just when that stuff was happening. But I didn't notice it. Right. You had to kind of be looking for it in some way, I think, or be in those spaces. But when I did come around, I was like, what the fuck? Well, yeah, like, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's 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 I don't I don't know if it's died down because people are still using the the sort of buzzword cudgel to like address sure. quote unquote eco-fascism and all that. And I think there's important things to address regarding that to mm -hmm. figure out, you know, what works and what doesn't. Yeah. I guess speaking of eco-fascism, we can jump to this question is um, there's a few times in the book and it's usually, if I remember correctly, referencing when people are speaking to you or when you're speaking to family members about, you know, droughts or sicknesses is that like the idea that nature is attacking humanity or at least is withholding the means of life uh so you know this idea that humans are a parasite nature is killing us that's you can find that anywhere on the political spectrum liberals or primitivists right and the common response to this that's eco-fascist right um has that ever that accusation that you're an act eco-fascist ever been leveled against you or if not still how do you recommend people kind of navigating that maybe it will after the book comes out. I have no idea. Um, <laughs> I, it's interesting that you use the term primitivist still, because I don't even know what year it is, but that's such an old fucking piece of jargon that mm -hmm. is really a temporal baggage of, you know, colonial logic. Mm -hmm. I, I don't like that term at all. Many other folks intentionally use a different term. So, but anyways, um, you know, uh, you know, leaning more into the semantics, I guess, <laughs> to address your question directly, particularly the word eco-fascist. I think it's 
as I mentioned, it's, it's a cudgel mostly wielded as a categorical shutdown, in my opinion. I think mm -hmm. a lot of people don't understand where that term actually comes from. If you look at it, it's like, you know, these folks, like you said, pushing population control, seeing that as the, you know, biggest problem we're facing. I mean, that was even written in the, the shitty book, which is, there's a lot of problems with the anarchist cookbook. Uh, immigration, wow. <laughs> and, you know, like eugenics and, you know, the whole concept of blood and soil. That's really where that comes from. It's some Nazi shit that was developed by hard right fucks who try to dominate human existence and meaning. And to me, it's like, where the fuck is the anarchy in that? Except for like, you know, these weird anarcho neo tribalists that, you know, have been run out of right. places, thankfully. Mm -hmm. um, you know, who the fuck actually identifies with it? And you can see who does. Uh, if they do, or at least aligns. Um, and I don't think like, you know, to me, like navigation or trying to figure out, you know, where to, you know, address it or not, it should be the point, but it, to confront the misuse of the term in the ideology in the context of those fighting fiercely to defend Mother Earth, um, because it can be hyper dismissive of folks who have you know, those perspectives, relationships, and understandings of the imbalance we're facing. I and mean, we're in the fucking precipice. What people call the global collapse, the greatest crisis facing humanity is, you know, climate change, which we, in, I, in the book I assert is, and, and this is coming from teachings from some of my Hopi relatives, um, saying um, globalization or uh, climate change is a consequence of the war against Mother Earth. So, you mm -hmm. know, the corporations are the ones who are fucking extreme, you know, the, right. the, the fucking states and industrial society, like as it's constituted is fucking extreme. Like, you know, the, those who are fighting back, like, you know, the ELF, ALF and others who are trying to find creative means to fucking address this collapse. Um, and, and mitigate it to some degree, I think. It's interesting to see where and how people categorize them. Um, you know, it, it can't also be ignored that some green anarchists have affinities close to some fucked up people espousing sure. and reinforcing such ideas that you mentioned, like um, Kaczynski. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I personally don't see how that's too much different than someone like John Muir, who started the Sierra Club, though, and all the fucking mm -hmm. colonial eugenicists who were and are trying to breed the civilized world into our being, or even the genocidal manifest destiny maniacs creating the strategy of boarding schools and forced sterilizations of indigenous women. Right. I mean, to me, it's, and it's pretty much the same patterns. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot that has been written and a lot that needs to be deeper critiqued, but those affinities fucking, you know, I don't know. The moment I see people like, you know, circulating ship of fools. I look the other way. I stop listening. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I find it interesting when, you know, when I argue with some, you know, people, again, using the term self-described primitivists, or I guess within the anti-civ milieu generally, right. Is that like some of them, I got into an argument with one, I can't tell you how long ago this was, but we were talking, I was like, yeah, like if we're, you know, it's one thing to be, you know, if you're British and you live in, Britain or you're Irish, you live in Ireland, you're French, you live in France, right? And you have this critique. I think it's a very different, like where we even begin is very different than if you live, if you're European descended and you live in the Western hemisphere, right? Because then it's like, you're, we're not here without colonialism, right? And so like, and then they're, they're just, oh, that's leftist identity politics. And it's how can you even, yeah, it just, it gets frustrating because it's, yeah, like there, there is something to be said about identity politics, but recognizing colonialism and white supremacy, that is a thing that predates identity politics. And to just dismiss it that way is just people, I think they're trying to, much like the eco-fascist thing, right? It's a cudgel against discussion. You know, they're trying yeah. to avoid it. Yeah, essentializations don't really help us, but I, I mean, we can talk and I write more about that in my book. Yeah. So. You know, but yeah, just all that, it, it's frustrating to listen to and to navigate. And, you know, I don't do the essentializing and my, a lot of my stances on this have changed. And I'd say in the last two years, um, having met people. What, what changed you know, it? Yeah. Yeah. Like moving out of the echo chamber. Right. Because there's one thing to always talk about indigenous people, 
right? Like, oh, like as a anti-civil anarchist, you know, we need to cooperate and listen to them. But on the basis of where I live and things like that, I like I live south of Chicago. I live in Illinois, south of Chicago, which is one of the bigger populations of, of urban based indigenous peoples. But I don't, you know, I I literally just didn't have a lot of interaction. And but it's also like don't make a monolith or like, oh, I see indigenous people with the same opinions online, but I think that is different than knowing them in person. Right. And then having met indigenous people, oh, quite a few indigenous people of various perspectives when I went to college, you know, that that shaped my perspective a lot, but also like teaching. And so I'm a high school English teacher and the population of students I work with was very different than the population of students I went to school with. Right. So just my perspective on race relations, not even race relations, but how I talk about race and my relationship to it has changed a lot because, I, you know, I admit, like, when I first got into politics, it was the white savior type or not even white savior, but also like white guilt. Right. And I've moved past that because it's bullshit and I hate it. But it's also like I, I've come to realize I know a lot less than I thought I did is the way I would put it, if that made sense. Oh, I've heard this over and over again. Yeah. And so it's the way, I, you know, when I'm confronting someone and it's particularly two white people arguing and it's like, do either of us have enough authority on a subject to say anything? And it's, oh, it's like, well, my, my indigenous or black friend said I could say this. Well, mine said this. And it's like, it just goes in fucking circle. It's just fucking annoying. I'm like, I'm tired of having those arguments, but I'm they just tired. come up. I'm, I'm tired of listening to it right now. So let's move <laughs> on. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah. So moving moving on it, we're kind of within the sphere of kind of the, the anti-civilization critique and you critique civilization a lot in your book it comes up and sometimes you put in quotations and other times you don't and i'm curious what motivates that when you say civilization with quotations do you mean something differently when it's not in quotations well, thankfully the publisher called me out on my square scare quotes so I had a temper of their use because in my all my other writings I, I use them a lot and I realized it was just mainly because um you know I contend with the term uh, the translation of it is just really one that should always be contended with. It should stand out and be questioned. Um your your question, um I'm trying to get more a sense of your question. Yeah, so I'm just I guess I'm curious. When you speak about civilization, it seems to be in a, in a form of condemnation. Do you consider yourself not in so much in the milieu of anti-civilization, but to be against civilization, if that makes sense? I, I mean, I, I tried to answer this question throughout the book, so it's a, right. interesting to me that maybe it's lost here. Um, but I preference whole chapters or some chapters with the whole quotes of uh, colonial invading forces, particularly military or politicians that clearly state that their mission was mm -hmm. to impose civilization upon indigenous peoples and lands. Um, right. In, in my research, it was odd that very few indigenous authors or scholars have actually connected these dots in a succinct way, aside from uh, Robles Ricos, as I mentioned before, Aragorn to some degree. Mm -hmm. Um, but not fully, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely been, you know, academics like Jack Forbes, Columbus and other cannibals, uh, John Mohawk, Ho Mohawk, who I mentioned before, and, uh, to a degree, the poet and state collaborator form, you know, you know, it was passed on John Trudell, former AIM spokesperson. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and I, I, I'm not going to count Ward Churchill for obvious reasons, but you know, nobody's really connected those dots, even though it has been clearly a project, colonialism has been clearly a project to civilize. Mm -hmm. um, and it m maybe, uh, you know, some other, in some other project, myself or someone else will really dig into that. And I think it would be very interesting to actually have a reader addressing a lot of um, the impetus uh, behind colonial expansion manifest destiny in terms specifically rooted in the civilizing. Uh, you know, I could only imagine if somebody like Vine Deloria Jr. had less liberal inclinations and actually took that to task, how phenomenal that would have been. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, but back to your position, or back to your 
your question about my position. Uh, you know, let me maybe restate this and, and start it by asking you, or actually re yeah, re revisit the question by asking you, how do you define civilization? Yeah, and that's, a, that's always a, an interesting question. And the reason, I guess, I'll, I'll answer your question to me, but also the reason you, you mentioned earlier that you thought maybe it's getting lost. And I don't think it's so much lost as the question of civilization is interesting because, you know, when I tell people I'm anti-civilization, they take that to be racist. They're like, oh, so like hunter-gatherers don't have civilization or this group don't have civilization because they they see civil they're making civilization like a moral positive, which is really funny for people that identify as like anti-racist, but then they say everyone has civilization, which to me, that's, it's a reproduction, but it's also in contradiction with, as you talked about, like the civilizing mission. And it, to me, I think it's a, it's a, a correction they're trying to make that's motivated by good, but it's not the right answer, in my opinion, right? Is to say, oh, well, they wanted to bring civilization. They just didn't recognize they already had civilization, which is why I was curious why you put it sometimes in quotation marks and not in others, because I thought perhaps that was kind of what you might've been getting at. But for me, civilization starts with agriculture. Not all agriculture leads to civilization, obviously. Right. But there's a type of agriculture, Daniel Quinn called it totalitarian agriculture, right? That it it includes the existence of other things. Right. And then there's the hoarding and then the warfare. I guess my definition of civilization is class society, right? Because class society necessitates urbanization and it you know necessitates stratification and colonialism. And yeah, I, I that's probably generally my kind of like short answer for what is civilization. Class. Interesting. Usually that's attached to Capitalism, curious as to mm -hmm. how that works out in your time frame. Well, I guess civilization, you know, capitalism is just the latest stage of civilization, I guess, if you want to put it on like a linear path. But we had class society before civilization, right? You had feudalism and, and serfdom and slavery, right? What is civilization in Rome is different than civilization now. Like the essential features are all the same, but Was it's... Was that before civilization though? I'm curious. What do you mean? Uh, well, I, I don't know if that's before civilization. I'm curious as to class society and that stratification happened before this idea. Yeah, I guess, I guess it's hard to say like when a chicken or the egg happens, right? We see stratification, you see specialization, but what is, and I guess that gets into are you, what type of de definition of class are you using? And I guess in some way I'm using the classic leftist definition, who owns or is dispossessed, right? You could even say is the, the notion of those who possess and those that don't. Right. If you want to use a broad notion of classes, perhaps that's where civilization begins. And when does civilization start to form versus this is this is civilization, right? And that's the whole anthropology thing is anthropologists. And I've talked to Steve Kirk about this, who's editor of Oak Journal, that this idea that anthropologists want to understand everything. And you kind of touch on this, that they need to be able to answer and categorize and systematize that maybe in some way that doesn't work. Right. And so like trying to find the root of civilization can be difficult if yeah, because you're trying to, you know, Baden, who you quote, reference uh, anthropologists as grave robbers. And the only difference between a grave robber and an anthropologist is a PhD. Yeah, I mean, oh. without getting too much into that. I'll, let me offer my, I guess, attempt to define, if you will. Sure. Um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't believe, well, civilization cannot be defined without discussing what is not civilized. Okay. And that's the wild savage, barbarity, social deviance, uh, nature outside of dominion or domination. Mm -hmm. So civilization to me is the organization of humans into a social order that is based upon the domination, control, and exploitation of Mother Earth and existence. Mm -hmm. It's the antithesis of the wild. It's socially constituted violence against the Earth. You know, whether we address invader settler or resource colonialism to me colonization is actually the brutal mis missionization and maintenance of civilization mm -hmm. um and the idea of progressing that is not to paraphrase too much mao but to me progress is the opiate of the civilized mm. and you know i'm sure you you have but i really recommend your uh, your audience read the first issue of Black Seed. Um, it features an article that was originally in one of the Green Anarchy 
uh, magazines uh, back to basic primers, which actually I distributed way back at Talon Info Shop, and I don't know, but I think probably before I don't know, even remember what year, year, year it came out. Um, you know, and I, I had problems with Green Anarchy, and I was really reluctant to embrace the anti civ position for a long time. I mean, the first matter that was a huge turnoff was really just the white settlers attempting to rewild on stolen lands and this sort of like odd, like we got we got it figured out, you know, sort of posturing. Oh, sure. Of the, you know, like, but, but when I got into the materials and read, you know, Moore's Primer that you reference, I read Zerzan, I read Jensen's shit before he went full turf mode. Oh, boy. D DGR bullshit. And, um, yeah. you know, you mentioned Daniel Quinn. I read Ishmael and those books and you know all these fucking cis, cis dudes that i'm re referencing um <laughs> you know in, in in many ways the matter for me doesn't come down to locating a primary contradiction for attack but understanding the root causes of so much disharmony in the world mm -hmm. uh, so we can track these ideas and actions especially here in these occupied lands through the colonizers very explicit instructions as i referenced earlier to dominate and specifically Civilize the words that they use, the world in the name of whatever king, god, state, authority, etc. You know, I, 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 it's really interesting if you read the requirimento, which I reference, of the conquistadors who were part of the first wave of colonization and decimated indigenous people in so-called California, oh, California, and and yeah. the papable in Tessera, which was the document that was part of the uh, the push that was came out after Columbus by the papal or the, the, the Pope at the time from the Vatican. Um, you know, all this shit we're facing now comes down to those specific instructions, which are um, heavily filled, not just coded with the terminology of domina domination and civilization. They talk about dominion as part of, you know, their uh, sacred duty established through their instructions, which is the Bible. You know, it's fucking, you know, still part encoded in, in, in not just coded, but it's clear in the infrastructure that we face in the ongoing um, uh, forces of the state that we face as the constituted, you know, entity of the so-called U.S. Uh -huh. um, so to me, that's, you know, my position. Um, because I, as I mentioned in the book, you know, how have we, come to know civilization what you know the, has that meant to us as indigenous people in this context and that's the context mm -hmm. so how yeah, could i, I not I, be against civilization if it's right. clearly opposed to mother earth and the, clearly premised on the domination exp control and explanation and just flat out genocide and enslavement of indigenous people yeah. the ultimate fucking fulfillment of civilization which is still at play today mm. is indigenous non-existence and yeah complete you know just destruction or exploitation of nohastan or mother earth yeah i just it and it's and a reason i i kind of asked you that is you know you know there's a variety of anti-civilization perspectives and people come at it from different ways and their expression of it and all that um and hopefully people have some type of anti or decolonial perspective right whether it's limited or not but you know sometimes people who are anti-civ get asked it's like well what about indigenous civilizations are you against those like if you're anti-colonial you know or what you know i remember someone asked me so would you are you in favor of the conquistadors tearing down the aztec empire and i'm just like what the fuck <laughs> i feel like i've that like shifts the goalpost away from like what we live in now it's like that's what you're asking me to do is do this weird pick and choose kind of thing as opposed to actually getting to my critique but you who, know who named it an empire the aztec people mm -hmm. i mean there's a narrative there that's really lost and not right. understood um you know, there's uh, plenty of uh, sifting through the bullshit. People who have sifted through the bullshit of 
projections of European scientists trying to justify their own tendencies towards domination. Oh yeah. And it's hard to get through and they project these assertions, you know, this certainly some in some people of the earth have dreamt of empires. Uh, you know, you can go back to Genghis Khan. He's indigenous. Um, certainly there are other examples of mass skilled societies whose spiritual practices align with the earth. Um, and I contend that those that have tended towards domination have broken from that circle of existence okay. and harmony. So, you know, if you actually talk to indigenous peoples and in lands where some of these so-called indigenous civilizations were that really are projections of these scientists who are trying to figure out where and how things fit in their world from their perspective. You know, mm -hmm. There are a lot of interesting stories written in wild growth that's overtaking ruins. Mm -hmm. you'll, you'll see and experience the creation accounts of people going towards the ashes and continuing moving mm -hmm. forward, finding that that wasn't the way to go. And they're brought back right. into the circle of existence. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I mean, I think it's, you know, it's, a, it's a, to me, it's a non-question when we really talk about what civilization is in terms of like folks who are responding saying, well, what about, you know, these, these civilizations that have existed and are you being anti-black or anti-indigenous? Um, we have to first understand what we're talking about in this context of the brutalities in existence and what we mean by civilization first, and then go from there. Because I don't think we're talking about the same word. We're not talking about the same thing. Right. If, uh, folks are coming at it from that perspective. Yeah, that's a really good way to put it is, you know, and again, like I said, it seems to be shifting the goal, but like, it's one of those, oh, instead of confronting the hellscape that we're in, that we're trapped in, right? Because, you know, we're not citizens, we're captives. I think, was that you that said that in the book or maybe you're quoting someone there's no citizens there's captives right and they want to do these like weird mind games or word games to like justify their own servitude it just it just really frustrating because then it gets paired with identity politics and if you're not in favor of identity politics you must be anti-xyz right that's how some people frame it anyways and it just can get really frustrating to try and navigate that if you come from a particular place of privilege in particular where it is easier yeah to like yeah like, I get it. Like, why, if you're a white person that's anti civ or whatever, like, it's, I get where some people come from. I don't agree with it, but I can see to some degree, I guess, where it comes from. If that made sense. Yeah. These lands, these sacred lands here in the so called Southwest are full of ruins. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I get you, you were talking about, it and I, I really want to hit it because I, I know there's going to be people that listen to this. And they're going to call and they're going to text and they're going to email me. They won't comment. <laughs> they won't comment, but they'll talk to me about it. Uh, so I, if you get upset by this next point, I would love for you to comment. Uh, but, you know, you're talking about rewilding on stolen land or the hippie that wants to be, to live on the land that's stolen. Or the hipster, Just, yeah. <laughs> the, the hipster, yeah, excuse me, not the hippie, the hipster. Um, Both of them, whatever. Yeah. Um, so if someone, you know, is anti civ and they're and they are following your your point so far. Like, okay, I'm on stolen land. I can't re-indigenize or claim a, the same type of relationship because it's stolen and the trauma that's built into the land and the relationships. Without asking you to to give like a step by step answer or a blueprint, what would you say to someone that says, okay, I'm interested in building or developing a worldview or a life way separate from civilization that isn't appropriative? Right. Is that is that even possible? Or like how would that discussion even start if that's something you'd even be willing to talk about? Of course it's it's uh possible. I mean, there's a difference between appropriation and meaningful exchange. Mm -hmm. Throughout existence, various peoples, cultures, and you know, you you mentioned earlier that I might get tagged or flagged as a eco fascist or whatever. I, I'm a I was actually more conscious of being you know, sort of decried as ethno-nationalist, you know, because mm. but that's, that, that would just, it's just a bullshit thing that I actually address in the uh, intro right. to some degree. But um, uh, because there are meaningful exchanges throughout existence, we can't live without relating somehow. 
to each other in existence, and that includes non-human beings in our cosmologies. The water, the spirits, the air, the sacred mountains, Mother Earth, Nohasan, Yadithith, you know, sky. So for me, that's, you know, what it comes down to. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Um, so when, we get, into, when we get into the discussion of rewilding on stolen land, I mean, you're really going to have this, like, it's interesting because right now, Palestinians are in resistance to the colonial occupation invasion of the settler colonial proxy state of Israel. And it's, it'd be audacious to ask the same question there. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Because I, you know, there's, I won't name names, you know, because they're not here to argue their own point, but there's, some primitivists or self-identified rewilders that I know that they're basically like, well, if I'm not able to live off the land, okay, I'll put it like this and I, I won't tiptoe around it. They are like, well, I'm, they basically say I'm more indigenous than indigenous people that support corporatism because I live off the land or I'm trying to build a relationship. And like, I, if I sh squint my eyes and I like turn my head, I'm like, I think I see what you're trying to say, but you're totally fucking losing me. Right, because if they're going off, you know, what you said earlier, it's a relationship to the land, sure, but it's also like the, your relationship to or to earth, right? It's also a social relationship. And yeah, so you well, still me, have privilege or, or stop you whatever. Hit, yeah. Let me stop you and hit that because this is this has already been addressed in other spaces. Um if if, if these are green anarchists, you know, saying this, people who associate in have affinity with the other principles of anarchism, then that's a, a extraordinarily disconnected perspective of imposition and domination. The logic mm -hmm. is extraordinarily colonial and entitled, um, and it, it it completely undermines the idea of consent, which mm -hmm. should be how we inform how we relate to each other. In this world yeah we're 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 wounded through and there's a lot of neo-colonial people you know you can't just go to any dinette person because there's we have fucking we're not a monolith as you, you know you use that term we have indigenous um zionists and fucking christian conservatives and you know capitalists and all sorts of fucking shit that mostly was just fragmented product products of boarding school violence and the internalized colonialism and then the celebration sort of uncritical understandings of neocolonialism. Uh, so yeah, I mean, you can go to all these different folks and say the same thing. I, I was, you know, touring with my bomb, but band, band Blackfire running into all these, um, what they call Euro Indians. Not just mm. like uh, there's hobbyists and Euro Indians. Hobbyists do like weekend powwow shit, and they, you know, try to dress authentically and have powwows and weird fucking bullshit based on some fetishism they have. Oh, and I know you're talking about. They're a problem. Yeah. And then there's the Euro Indians, which actually learn the languages. They try to understand these teachings. And one time I was at a playing in in Prague the Czech Republic and there was a few people who came in and uh, it was it was like a weird sort of small bar anarchist sort of bar place and very hot stinky and there's a table of these folks who are all dressed really beautifully in this like clearly handmade well-worn um attire from you know we could identify which indigenous peoples they're from that they were inspired by and, and we sat down and we we literally just sat at their table and we talked to them we we're like fuck are you guys <laughs> what are you doing here and um they were characters you know one of them spoke english and translated for the rest and they you know were very clear like one of them was like i fight fight nazis and he had his tomahawk right there and you know one guy had an eagle feather in his hair what the fuck in in this bar and i was like you know i'm curious as to how you feel about wearing that you know, how that came to you um 
And he said, oh, I know you're a good Indian. I'm not a real Indian. I'm a bad Indian. And I was like, what? no, that's not my point. I, I want to understand where you're coming from, what the point is here and, and, you know, what your connection is. And maybe somebody gifted it to you or ceremony, whatever. And then he just took it off and gave it to me. And I was like, I, that's not what I want. That's not what I'm asking. And it was really, you know, uncomfortable. But this is a dynamic. There's whole villages in some parts of Europe where people have just opted to recreate specifically documented you know, historical uh, parts of indigenous societies and live that way um, mm -hmm. off the land, literally anti-civ uh, in yeah. the Alps or in the Czech Republic or other places and speak Lakota or whatever, you know. Um, and the reason I share that story is because I see the same like weird attitude like you know a long time ago there was a attempt to have this rewilding gathering up in occupied ute lands outside of so-called durango colorado and i was like it's great that y'all are connecting and, and having these discussions and i had some relatives who went out there i wasn't able to go but i was like what's your relationship to the ute you know, have you have you connected in any way and they're like no it's too much too much work there's too many people to go through and they don't all agree. And I was like, okay, you're not willing to do the work. That's what matters. You're not willing to build a relationship to a point to even establish consent and fuck you. Mm. <laughs> like, you know, how many, how many centuries on your time frames, your chronology, does it take for us to get to a point where quote unquote people are okay just saying we're still here and we're resilient and you're not even going to take a fucking break to just travel and talk and build relationships, share food, you know, go to, you know, whatever spaces you can be welcome in. Cause some, in some places it's not going to be that way. Some places are going to be like, fuck y'all. We're, we're not going to just like your friend. I'm done talking to white people. I'm done relating to them. I'm not going to welcome in the space. And they're not wrong, especially in this context. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, you know, that whole, push to have that gathering the underlying premise was still a colonial imposition mm -hmm. uh, and, and there's no way around it it's an attitude of domination and imposition you know so don't try to say you're not you know like these people are are corporate these people are whatever it's just like yeah for every you know corporate person there's probably you know some young indigenous person who's finding their voice and reconnecting and strengthening their ancestral ways you know it's like you're just going to categorically shut them down and do your own thing well fuck you colonizer mm. i think i mean that's how is that not missionizing civilization right. yeah i think you know the use of consent that the you talking about it like that i had thought about it like that before i that's really I think that actually really gets to it in a way I I hadn't thought about before. So I appreciate you answering that because that's that whole place of rewilding has been really tense because I get why people want to do it. If it's motivated by an acknowledgement of civilization, like, I get it, but it's not simple and people want shit to be really simple. You know what I mean? Or well, just, oh, I do, do the hard fucking work that it takes. Right. It's not easy work. Right. It requires you to be humble and step outside of this easy sort of pass way that is facilitated by your sense of entitlement. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a colonial logic, as I mentioned before, which is rooted in the missionization of civilization to begin with. Yeah. So it's yeah. fucking bullshit. And, 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 and the, I cut you off, apologize. But the reason I did is because it's not just about the consent of the people. The consent mm -hmm. of the people comes with the consent of the land. Right. And, that's always part of it. Mm -hmm. What is our relationship to land? How have we consented? You know, so like, you know, people talk about, and this is what I, you know, when I address identity politics in my book and some of these other things, it's like, you know, I'm not trying to dismiss or address, you know, our black kin relatives um, who are, you know, asserting their um, relationship to the land and who are so alienated that they're 
you know, one um, survivors of brutal colonial enslavement and dispossession as indigenous people, um, but figure out ways we can build relationship and offer that connection. You know, mutuality is key and mutuality can't happen without consent. It's not, mm -hmm. you know, people are going to think that, yeah, it's about appropriation. It's like, no, let's talk about meaningful exchanges. What creates that? And, and to me, in, in a Diné context, it's going to be different than the Haudenosaunee, than the Lenape, than the Inde, or, you know, so many other indigenous peoples relating to the land because they have different instructions of how to be with the earth. They have different, you know, mm -hmm. ways of being and working in this world and it's, Sometimes the answer is not going to be what people want to hear, and they have to be okay with that. Yeah. So, yeah, and I that's mean, why I advocate, you know, not to find your place and carve out your fucking autonomy on stolen lands and rewild, but to attack. That's the that's the clear option. Why why replicate and perpetuate settler futurity on these lands? Let's. Mm -hmm find meaningful ways to engage in its liberation. And this is why, you know, I, I initially was in some ways attracted to the anti-civ analysis because they're the only ones who actually had some shit figured out in terms of strategy, which is extraordinarily simple. It's just fuck shit up until civilization crumbles. Yeah. I, I just had a point, and then my dog fucking looked at me, and now I lost it. Oh shit! What was I gonna say? Must be a God. mystifying dog. I I literally I looked down at him for a second while you were talking. I looked up, and whatever point I had, oh, totally just left my mind. Fuck. It's probably better that way. They have some <laughs> yeah. strong medicine. It's probably that they're saying that it's getting late. We talked too long. Yeah. So you know, we we kind of been talking. And it's been an underlying point of our discussions is like colonial logic, right? Or the anti-settler. Um, and so in the book, you reference the literacy and illiteracy of settler colonialism. Would you say those terms are like logic? Like, would you say like the literacy of, of colonialism? Is that like synonym of like the logic of it? Or, or do you mean something else? Like how it's expressed and the language it uses? Um. It is part of the challenge that I think is at the root of what we face in terms of how people are trying to establish, assert, and control human meaning. How mm -hmm. that is written, how it is narrated through story or myth, how it is mm -hmm. perpetuated through the sciences that are documented in books and established as the way and so forth. So, you know, I, I contrast, you know, this whole section probably could have been a much more succinct and interesting academic theory section. And it, maybe somebody else will jump on it. Maybe, maybe somebody else already has, I don't know. Um, but I contrast it with the teachings of my father who, you know, he went to boarding school. He, he grew up when he was 20. I mean, he, he grew up, sorry, he grew up on the res uh, in Black Mesa and he was taken away from that existence, never speaking English, you know, herding sheep, driving a wagon, no electricity, no running water, until he was 20 years old and they kidnapped him and took him to boarding school in Sherman Institute, Riverside, so-called California. And he went to school for three years, and I don't, I don't want to get into it because he actually doesn't even like to talk about his experiences at boarding school, but he was old enough yeah. at that point. He was established as a medicine practitioner, cultural practitioner, had a lot of knowledge he kept because of how intact, you know, his teachings were and are. And, you know, he, um, and I don't say this in a way to like evoke pity or anything, but he, you know, he doesn't really read, he reads a little bit and English is a second language. Um, and it's the broken. Some people don't, some people who don't have familiarity with people who don't have good English, quote unquote, 
don't un, don't really understand what he's saying sometimes, and that's fine. He's totally fine with it. He never read stories out of books to us when we were children. But as I mentioned in the book, you know, in my weird prose that I switch on and off, <laughs> if you can bear it, reading the book, <laughs> um, you know, he read he narrated the stories of our existence in relationship to the land that we live on, the sacred lands that we walk upon, the herbs that we would gather, the ceremonies and the experiences. And to me, it's just a question of pathways, as I mentioned before, and that's really what this book is about. Mm -hmm. There's different ways of understanding the world. And yeah. there's some ways that need to be, uh, those understandings are imposed. They need to be challenged. And done away mm -hmm. with. Mm -hmm. Because they are what for many people define human existence and meaning. It's mm -hmm. a big part of this fight. Okay. Yeah, I think, you know, when you first started saying literacy and illiteracy, it's like that stood out to me because I, I liked it a lot. Like, I guess, you know, understanding might have been a better way to say because I hadn't seen it ever expressed in that language. And it stood out to me as, you know, a little bit more encompassing than like, oh, you know, and I said people say the logic of civilization, the logic of colonialism. But I said when you when you started saying literacy and illiteracy, it was a little bit more inclusive is the wrong word, right? But more it got to the root of things a little bit more and it expressed it in a way, like I said, I hadn't seen before. So I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, I take a lot of risks writing this book <laughs> in the experiment in but that was one thing that was has always been clear to me since I was a kid, because it's been mm -hmm. there as a force in my life. Just edu colonial education system. My dad today, as I mentioned in the book, still calls schools knowledge factories. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is something I probably should have asked when we were first talking about the book, because it's in the title. When you say sacred, what does sacred mean? Because some people... They think sacred, you know, they have a, a Western Christian view that sacred is something that's above us, right? It's um, transcendent while other people, right? In, in I kind of get this impression from you and correct me if I'm wrong. It's something that's more imminent, right? As if it's, it's, it's relational, not transcendent, right? So what, what do you mean? What is, what is and what is not sacred? Is sacred, as you've been talking about, living with the earth and acknowledging your relationship to it? I don't define that in the book because this question frustrates the fuck out of me, especially Oops. coming from colonizers. <laughs> I address mm -hmm. the dynamic in the book, but I don't respond to it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the real question to me is like, why are you asking? What are you seeking to understand? What's the purpose of that question? Does it help us establish um, relationality? Or are you just looking to put a, a pin on something mm. so you can figure out how it can qualify for solidarity. Uh, mm. You know, I, I don't want to be too dismissive, but, you know, how about this? Like the Notre Dame catches fire and what happens? The world you know, freaks out, right? Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. They rush to save it. They have to preserve it, whatever. Here at the base, uh, the Coast leads one of our most holy sites and as I mentioned before, it's holy to 13 indigenous nations or sacred. And uh, it's been qualified, documented studies. And I mentioned what sort of constitutes that, you know, in terms of a place of emergence in this world, a place where we gather herbs, we can't gather other places, a place where we make offerings. And, you know, there's many, many, many things spiritual deities live. Um, you know, and the fact that that place can be clear cut ravaged with development and have 180 million gallons of treated shit water sprayed on it. So right. people can slide down the slopes, you know, contrast. What does right. the sacred mean? What does it not mean? And we, we, in our fight to protect this mountain, which we lost, we failed, uh, but it's not over. And mm -hmm. that's absolutely an understanding, but it, Throughout the book, you'll see, it, especially the beginning, it informs a lot of my analysis and political deterioration. Mm -hmm. um, we ask that question, what part of sacred don't you understand? Right. And it's a confrontational question. It should be, because we talk 
you have to talk about what we mean by spirit, spiritual. You have mm -hmm. to talk about what we mean by religious. Anything can be religious or ritualistic, but you know these terms, they, they translate differently. They're expressed differently in different cultural contexts, mm -hmm. and especially by you know Western forces, occupying forces. Yeah. And so it's it's a it's a question that a lot of people, especially fetishists, really want answered because they want a sense of ownership and belonging. They want mm. to feel soothed by the response that they can be connected to it. And so they burn sage mm. that's, you know, harvested without prayerful intention. They rub some crystals together or whatever and, you know meditate and that's you know i'm not going to challenge people's spirituality and their beliefs but when it comes down to you know that fetishized gaze and trying to feel part of something just like you said with people saying oh i'm more indigenous than these people or i'm i'm native i was born here it's like yeah that's a blood and soil attitude motherfucker. yeah oh my god you want to yes. talk about eco-fascism Right. Let's actually let's let's sort of unpack that and actually see how that maybe correlates more towards right that sense of entitlement. You know, fuck that point. By the way, that I was born here. Let me clear. Yeah. I had a relationship, and when I had a girlfriend, say that to my face when we were mm -hmm. talking about that stuff. Malafa was over at our apartment, and we were talking, and he made a joke. He he likes to do this. It's kind of like a almost a test, I guess you could say. He made a joke and said, "Well, I'm going to deport." For white people to Albania. It's just a fucking joke. She was like, well, why me? I was born here. And I was just like, oh, fuck. I just, uh, I remember hearing that. I'm just like, the relationship ended when that, when that was said. Just like, oh, fuck. Yeah, that's yeah no, every time I think about that, it's a uh, breaker, definitely. Um, yeah. And your, your friend sounds interesting. I'd love to talk with them. Yeah, I mean, he, you know, what's funny is he's texted me. He texted me during when we took our little break. I texted him. And he, mm. you know, he wants, he wants your contact info and he, he wants to touch, touch base with you. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, I'm sure we'd have a different conversation, which is great. Um, but oh, yeah. yeah, like the, the point though, about, you know, MX, uh, what is it, uh, deporting people to Albania, that's a Churchill, you know, like very clear, um, his position. Um, mm -hmm. and I, I think it's just, it's too, uh, simplistic and things are more complicated than that, but. I I, mm -hmm. I go over that in the book. Yeah, but yeah. It's it's nice and sensational. I think it's great to confront yeah. people on those levels yeah. and actually challenge them because, like, again, like that wouldn't be a radical thing to address in the West Bank, right? With settler occupiers, right, right, raising yeah. people's buildings. So why is it different here? Because you have yes a longer term legacy of you know in this in the occupied Southwest, it's only a hundred years of colonial occupation, you know, or or well. 1500s to some degree so a little bit farther and then uh -huh. you know the farther out east you go with the waves um you know it's, it's 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 a very fresh experience for many of us but yeah a lot of people don't see it that way they see it as a done deal and if, right especially if it's people who are coming from an anarchist position then that you know uh the the, the sort of colonial adjacency that that expression of anarchism has mm -hmm. needs to be done away with. Yeah. You know, that that reminds me um two things I kind of got there. It's, you know, you talk about the 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 shitty remark, oh, you want to go back to the Stone Age? You know, that fucking that resort that retort that people give. But when people say, oh, we can't, you know, anti-sid people get this, oh, we can't go back. To me, that's a really masked off expression, but they don't say that about colonialism. Right. But they mean it. Oh, we can't go back. We can't go back to a non, you know, which it's, it's still implying like it's a backwards movement. It's anti progressive, as you talked about the progressivist kind of mentality. Right. But it's it's similar. Right. Because they're equating. Yeah. It's a whole thing I, I won't get into because I think I don't know how to talk about it. Well, I, I, you, you brought it up at, I think, at the onset of the show. We talk about temporality and my challenges to it mm -hmm. in cycles. That's exactly where it is. It's like mm -hmm. civilization, you know, like like the sort of Western concept. Civilization lays things out linear, linearly, based upon its instructions, primarily through the the shit document, the Bible. Mm -hmm. And um, 
And then it follows that path because the ultimate conclusion of the Bible is what? Apocalypse? Revelations? Uh -huh. I mean, you know, so look at the linear time frame, time frame on that and look at how that tracks in terms of like how people parse things out in their understandings of existence. And that's why cycles are really important to understand and embrace and, and, and embody in many ways and connect to. And I, I, I talk a lot about that in different parts of the book, specifically for mm -hmm. this issue, because the moment you create this like tradition versus progress or modern versus, you know, the past, and, and you place people in that position, you're doing the job of the colonizer. <laughs> you're doing yeah, the job yeah, of civilization to, to put us in a position where we are not, you mm -hmm. know, people who are free in our experiences and understandings and move through this world in that way. But yeah, mm -hmm. going back to the stone age kind of bullshit, is just a, you know, dismissive, uh, right. cudgel again. That it's another cudgel. Yeah. There was a categorical shutdown. And I, I, I think it's, it's much more complicated and interesting than that. Absolutely. Right. Um, right. you know, because, you know, and I mentioned this in the book, but I don't elaborate too much, oh, but you know, people are like, well, you're anti, uh, or you're you're a, you're being ableist because what what about all the people who have electric right. yes. cut oh off? My God. Yes. yes, hospitals are going to fail. And it's like, wait, what are you saying about our cultural teachings and medicines and practices? Right, because right. My, you know, my my father and and other medicine practitioners, not just him, I represent him a lot because I grew up with him treating patients, and he had experience working inside the Indian health service clinics as a um, initial pilot program, pairing indigenous cultural teachings and practicing with um, all allopathic medicine doctors. Mm -hmm. And he always called them butchers. He still does. Oh. And pull pill pushers. And he's just like, they're not fixing people. They're only treating the symptoms, not the root causes. That's what our medicine mm. does. Mm -hmm. We work with the earth. We work with the knowledge of these plants to, to treat and work with people. We have places we used to have where there were specific, they were specific areas that were for care for people who were of different abilities, you know, to be with them in community and relationality, not just sacrifice them. So fucking hell, you know, we talk about all the infrastructure and the violence that it takes to sustain you know, and, and maintain the pharmaceutical industry yes. and the medical industry yes. and how violent that is through like just fucking pure capitalism in the context right. of the U.S. I mean, shit, that's like one of the biggest examples of why socialists, you know, pronounce their sort of like small victories in other places because at least they have a little bit more of a human eye in terms of trying to care for people and treat them. But don't put us in a time frame that, you think our shit is quote unquote antiquated because you're what you're really saying antiquated because you're what you're saying is it's barbarous it's savagery it's the wild it doesn't work but no mm -hmm. we still carry those practices and ancestral teachings for we still have relationships to those medicines and ceremonies that we use to bring ourselves back into harmony with existence and heal yeah i and have a powerful oh, and, and there and, and, and in, in my experience they're more effective than mm -hmm. the so-called Western medicine. I had a, always had a response to that kind of thing. And let me know what you think about this, because maybe it's out of place. But when people tell me, oh, you know, without civilization, my favorite, without civilization, anything that falls after that, I know I'm going to fucking laugh at it because it's about to be the worst dog shit argument I've ever heard. But it's like, without civilization, you know. You know, some some shithead that sits behind a computer all day with a stunted immune system is going to tell me how, you know, people without civilization live. And I'm so tired of it. It's like you'd be dead at 20. You stub a toe. You did an infection. And so my argument to them is would our traditional peoples, indigenous peoples, you know, past and present who are undergoing colonialism, if they don't assimilate to civilization, are they ableist because they're not allowing their their quote unquote disabled peers access to modern medicine? And they look at me, they're like, well, that's different. I'm like, why is it different? Because they weren't assimilated yet, so they have an agency in some... You know what I mean? Like, it doesn't add up. If they believe that civilization is required to make life 
accessible or good for people with disabilities or or quote unquote mental illnesses, right? You'd have to believe that all all these societies have to assimilate. You'd have to argue that, and they just aren't willing to because that's kind of like the silent part you can't say out loud, right? And again, it's all disabilities are for lack of better words socially relative, anyways. Like I had a friend explain it to me in a really good way that if we lived in a society in which our communication was by whistling. If you couldn't whistle, it'd be a disability, but we don't live in a society like that. So it's not considered one, right? And it's all very, and the idea that you're independent because you use technology or medicines and you're not relying on people is this, it's the fetish, right? That you've made, you don't see the person behind the commodity and the, the labor that went into it, you know? And so you are dependent. You're just separated from the dependency, I guess. I don't know. I, that's a lot. I just don't know how you, how you think about those types of arguments. Or if you, whatever you think. I'll try to make it short. One, I, I contend with your use of our indigenous people and the way you sort of started the question. Mm -hmm. so I think that's a little off for me when people say our indigenous people. But anyways, um, to get... I said, I don't think I said our, I said like indigenous yeah, you know, people, you, but yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, anyways. Um, but uh, getting into the question, uh, I say you know, progress is the opiate of the civilized. Mm -hmm. And this, you know, people are hooked on modernity. Part of that is maintenance for coloniality, which is still persisting in, you know, extractive ways or settler, you know, ongoing settler occupations. Mm -hmm. So how do we reconcile it? Like I had a, I had a question, I had a discussion. And I don't want to sidestep the question of ableism because... You know, I, I deal with a lot of health stuff, but it's a question of root causes and where mm -hmm. a lot of this comes from. I mean, the fact that we're, you know, breathing in air that has microparticles of plastic and <laughs> drinking water that, you know, has microplastics in it. And, you know, we can look at all the carcinogens and the interesting ways that this society is poisoning us and killing us, how the foods are killing us that have been domestically produced, engineered, and, you know, so forth. Um, and see, if we don't see those connections, how can we rec even think to reconcile what the effects are, what the root causes of some of these social diseases or disharmonies are? And so again, from a Diné context, we have different ceremonies. We, have, we actually don't have, a, we don't just go out and do any ceremony you know, to fix somebody, you actually, we have a pre-process for ceremonies where we diagnose somebody to see what's wrong with them. Mm -hmm. but then then we treat them. And that's sort of the yeah. way to identify root causes when I will elaborate. Um, but uh, I was having a conversation with the indigenous academic. They were interviewing me about extraction issues and they were mainly trying to get to this point where their analysis was route just transition to green economy, addressing climate change and all this stuff, and particularly looking at the context of resource colonialism on Dinepike or the Navajo Nation. And uh, without getting too much into it and drawing it out, um, they, ultimately the discussion arrived at this point where they were like, well, what's your solution? And I was like, well, anything that can't be reconciled through our mountain soil bundles or just lege and our, our teachings, or Satnai Bikehojon, I, I don't think it's useful. Like, if we can't find a way to find some way to work with that, because we're, we're all full of contradictions. You know, we're on a fucking podcast using this tech. Right. And I'm sure you've had your contemplations and decisions whether or not you're going to use it or not as a weapon, right? Mm -hmm. um, and for propaganda purposes or whatever, you know, however you reconcile that. I, I'm not trying to assume you're justifying it because I think it's, interesting you know the way we find different ways to address these and reconcile these contradictions because they're going to be there until we bring this shit down um and hopefully in a joyous and celebratory manner um but yeah the conversation ended right when i said that when i huh. said you know we just reconcile it through our ancestral teachings and the original instructions they're not something far away they're living documents our, our, our relationship to spiritual beings, this is the way we put it, is we actually identify ourselves as Nohokati and Dine, 
which means a holy earth surface people. So we are spiritual beings. And mm -hmm. that relates to the spirits that we work with as a living coven in relationship. So we ask, does this work? Does this not work? If it doesn't work, fuck it. <laughs> it's that simple. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting. You know, it's surprisingly simple. When you put it like that, I mean, it's surprisingly, you know, I think people want to make things more complex sometimes than they are. And that's very simple. Does it work or does it not? Do you, 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 I mean, you, you started with, off your question with a huge elaboration on theory and that's what people want. I mean, it's because how they, it's how they understand the world and it's been digested and set as standards for them to accept as the way. And it's a domination of human meaning ascribed through, you know, colonial logics and you know the ultimate in the service of civilization through the configuration and exploitation and all of the components that comprise capitalism mm -hmm. yeah i um i appreciate that so i guess i had one question that i wanted to get to earlier because you were kind of hinting at it it's particularly at the beginning but because we've been going so long i'll leave it up to you if you want to answer it it's kind of the five common strategies in relation to defending sacred sites. And maybe if you want to contextualize them in specific struggles, because there's the administrative litigation, economic direct action, and international appeals. If you want to get into that, we can, but I also understand just by the sake of time, if you don't want to. So that's up to you. Uh, you know, the, I start the book out for people who haven't read it yet, and hopefully I'll put an audio book out and. Um, you know, before we conclude, I just want to shout out big thank you to Detritus Books. Mm -hmm. Lots of love because, you know, they were willing to take the risk in publishing this in a very hands-off editorial way, which is awesome. Great fucking looking uh, book, by the way. I just want to say that. The book itself just looks fucking awesome. <laughs> yeah, sometimes covers, you know, <laughs> matter, I guess. But um, appreciate that. Anyways, uh, yeah. Um, the reason I'm just going to say address the reason I outlined that strategy and it's because it's a strategy of failure. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my proposition, the hardest part of the, this book to write was the last chapter um, towards the colonial nothing, which is a riff off of, you know, the, the Novatar piece towards the creative nothing. Mm -hmm. And, um, it was really, really hard to write, and I found inspiration in, you know, Chelsea Watego's Another Day in the Colony, and the texts of Baden, as I mentioned, and Desert, which a lot of people fucking hate. Oh, boy. I saw you, you know, mention that. I was like, that's a, it's a bold move, but I appreciate it. <laughs> I think it's that bold. It's, if people can't read and be critical and read without, like, thinking anything is above critique, you know. And I, and I should have actually quoted Blessed is the Flame because that's actually a very powerful piece that I think most succinctly defines anarcho-nihilism. Um, but uh, yeah, I, 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 it took a lot of time sitting with those texts and some of the other ones that I feel like are the most interesting tendencies um, to explore and contemplate and contrast and challenge and figure out if they do work or not. And um, you can see I don't really have some conclusions, but I have thoughts, and um, and I take a lot of risks trying to figure out, you know, how that works, and I lay it out on the pages. Um, but yeah, it's it gets back into that point of leading into our failures and um, failing on our own terms, perhaps, and understanding the experience is not just as like you know to mask. Um, these sort of like, you know, symbolic wins or say that, you know, Standing Rock, for example, was a victory because of the cultural force. Certainly it was on those terms, but it didn't stop the pipeline. We right. have one of the greatest mobilizations of our time of indigenous people with amazing amounts of resources and eyes throughout the world affixed and the internal fucking parts of the struggle deteriorating and the state really composing itself with 
mercenary forces, you know, uh, to attack because of how much a threat some of those, the militant specifically forces were and yeah. what they saw sort of coming or could be and to suppress that movement. Um, and uh, it failed ultimately. You know, Gord Hill writes about, wrote about this on his blog, Warrior, Warrior Blogs, um, in real time. And, uh, and, I, and I put that in this book a lot, and I tie it into the failures of my experiences with the struggle to protect the Holy San Francisco Peaks and other sites. Um, mm -hmm. And I outline the strategy specifically because they're limited. And how, how, you know, it's it's one thing to just keep your banging your head against a wall. And a lot of people think if we have enough people banging our heads against the wall, eventually that wall will fall down. And sure, <laughs> maybe, but maybe there's a different way rather than just fucking inducing a shit of sacrifice to the carceral state and headaches and hemorrhaging and floundering and yeah. finding another way to fucking take that piece of shit wall down whether you call that wall civilization capitalism societal patriarchy white supremacy you know anti-blackness or you had such a yeah you i mean you had such an expansive critique because you talk about you're not reductionist at all whenever there's a chance to connect it to a struggle you do and i think it's fucking awesome i mean you do it all i mean throughout the book and i think it's great that you do you know, because I think it's really easy for people to be, oh, there's too much, it's too complex, it's, you know, whatever. And you you get to it and you talk about it, it's, it, it is these things and more. And I appreciated that a lot. Oh, thanks. I try to be intentional about some things, but it's really just trying to be mindful more than anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I and mean, I think with those those five strategies too, and maybe I'm wrong, and I, to kind of summarize it a little bit, is that in many ways this book, this book, is a response to that series of failures. Not so much that you're saying this is what we should have done, but kind of outlining maybe this is a motivation for why it failed in a different way. But to me, I kind of, that's how I read it anyways. It's a lot of it was a response to those five strategies and the context that you give, you know? So I just found that really, I'm not sure if that was intentional or maybe that's a possible reading, but that's how I read it. No, absolutely. It's, and it's one component because I go after you know, a range of other factors or uh, strategies and tactics that are very limited. I mean, they're very, you know, once you analyze the typical sort of like campaign strategies of any nonprofit or even like radical groups and campaigns, it's easy to see what set pathways they've chosen as strategic vehicles to accomplish their achievable goals on a measurable time frame. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Right, right. And, and and you can see how a lot of it just leads to a dead end of yeah. reinforcing, you know, settler colonial domination. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think it's great. The book, again, absolutely fucking amazing. Sh I should have read it a lot. Faster. Every time I picked it up, it was hard to put down. But I really appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, this is a book, you know, it's interesting because I didn't know, like, I've, you know, I've read some of your zines and I knew and I've listened to the podcast, but I really had no idea what to expect with Good. the book. And so I think that's why I was excited is that most things I've read are older things. I don't read a lot of new literature, I can admit. It's a lot of older stuff. And so it's like, oh, I know what this is. I've heard about it. But with this, it was it was a surprise and I was happy every time. Like I I read a page, I can't and I sent you a picture of it. I annotated the fuck out, out of this book. I got, you know, stamps around it or I've I've written in it, um, which I love doing. It's how, you know, it's one way to engage with the text at a slightly deeper level. Um, but there's just so much, whether it's, you know, I have a lot of I color coded it like, oh, blue is you mentioned zines or, or writings in general that I should I should check out. And so I have a lot of those because you, you know, it's not just you talking, you're engaging with other authors, which I think is awesome, right? Because some people, again, there's no reference point or concepts. You reference Aragorn a lot, other indigenous anarchists, even though their idea of indigenous anarchy might be different and you're engaging with it directly. And I think that's great. Yeah, I appreciate that. But I definitely didn't write the book to like have agreements with colonizers. Oh, sure. It's meant to be incisive 
sure and illicit debate and in many ways that's more what i'm looking forward to is the contentions or conflict right as you say this book is full of conflict and and no one's above critique you know i, I think mm -hmm. that, you know i'm i'm open to it and i'm welcoming it you know really because things as they are it's like those five points that you outlined that i write about clearly aren't working mm -hmm. yeah so i guess i just the last thing i'll ask you is you know this interview has been great um you know we didn't touch on everything and and partially least maybe i emphasized some things we should emphasize others but what what kind of final things do you want to say is you know what projects do you want to touch on or maybe you want to talk about the book a bit more like what should people take away from this and obviously it's from detritus books i guess you know for the promo you can check it out at detritus they're lovely and i will miss little black cart because i think they're the only two publishers that were actually publishing anything interesting in terms of mm -hmm. anarchism uh the rest of them have just sort of floundered and I don't even know what they're doing. But anyways, right. it's my own like little dig. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm, I'm preparing a short tour. I have some health issues, so it's going to be limited. Um, but I would like to travel with this book and the board game, which the board game is tied to this book in different ways as a different sort of pedagogical mechanism. Pardon the academic shit jargon. Um, <laughs> And uh, it, uh, um, yeah, I, I'd rather be in backyard around fires, having small conversations rather than big university halls. So hit me up um, if you want to try to bring me to an area um, and, uh, yeah, proliferate these bad ideas. You know, it's, I have a lot of bad ideas I put into one place and I've had the wherewithal mm -hmm. in my life to try a lot of them <laughs> and see what works and doesn't. <laughs> and most of them don't work and I'm still going. So I'd like to keep going and have conversations with other people who are like-minded and want to celebrate these beautiful, scarred, scary ideas towards our dreams and fulfilling them of liberation. And that's awesome. I mean, this has been, we're looking at probably almost two and a half hours at this point. So this is one of the longest episodes I've recorded. Oh no. Uh, the episodes seem to get longer and longer, and it's awesome. I fucking yeah, love it. Oh, shit. No, it's too long. I hate long podcasts, but whatever. Oh, I just me, I love them, but that's you know, I guess it's two different styles of podcasting, but I, I like it though. And then I go in, I go into the the analytics and I'm like, oh, people watch five minutes. That's fucking awesome. <laughs> Wow, that's great. <laughs> yeah, speaking as another podcaster, I guess. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I like, you know, there's a lot of people who just want to memify everything and get the slogans or the like pull quotes and but our 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 worlds are much more complicated and interesting than that. I mean, the book is out only on print right now for a reason. That's why initially Black Seed was only in print and not digitized initially engage with that sort of what people call analog you know and mm -hmm. um at some point i'll try to find time to record an audio version of the book because i want to make sure it's more accessible too mm -hmm. um but yeah this kind of material even the game is the same thing it's the idea is not to create a virtual you know video game or whatever but to create something that people can sit around and engage right. with each other and have these conversations whether they're challenging or uncomfortable and unsettling and those are the spaces that excite me the most the space between creativity and destruction that's fucking that's such a good way to put it um lee again this has been awesome i appreciate you coming on you know i hope that you know i always i always wonder it's like fuck did the guest have a good time because i 99 percent of the time i have a good time uh the other one percent the episodes don't go up which is rare but sometimes <laughs> it happens <laughs> Well, I'm laughing, so hey, maybe that says yeah. something. I, I, you know, it's it, podcasts are strange and sometimes alienating or disconnecting, but I look forward again to this conversations, small groups of people talking mm -hmm. about, you know, ideas in the book or other things that just like sit down and talk about the book and tea's good and we just start talking about something else. Yeah, that'd be yeah. great. Yeah. Well, this has been the Uncivilized Podcast. Thank you for listening.